This evening. Fire ticket. Okay. Yeah, we, we have, um, there are no table mics, as you may realize, uh, nor the uh, expansive cameras that we normally have. Colin, I think, uh, got caught up in some headwinds and couldn't get uh, back into town, uh, literally headwinds, and couldn't get back into town. So we're just going to make do the old fashioned way with okay. one camera. Yeah. <laughs> so, full attendance, please. Okay. Anthony? Here. Alan? John? Here. Greg? Here. Michelle? Here. Jim? Sorry. Stephanie? Here. I'm here. Mike? Here. Julie? <coughs> Jennifer? Here. And Peter? Here. Okay. We have a quorum? All right. Moving on. Uh, to item two on the agenda, public comments. Seeing none, we'll move to uh, item number three on the agenda, uh, which is a consent agenda. There are a number of items there. Is there any questions? If not, the items on the consent agenda pass. Before we go uh, into item four, I was asked by the superintendent if we could accommodate two of our guests and flip the agenda around. Are there any, uh, by bringing up the new topics, which are infrastructure and um, the security? If there are no objections, I'm going to uh, invite uh, Dick. Where'd you go? I knew I'd show you that. Good evening. Thank you for. Uh arranging the agenda for me. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm asked to speak tonight to uh, some of the happenings, uh, new items, uh, potential plans of what's happening in technology. And I'd like to start off with one of our biggest items, um, and it's the uh, state of where Power School is at. And we were just recently over the past uh, long weekend, we had our Power School instance upgraded to the latest version available to us. Um, it's obviously always good to stay up to date, but what it's going to help us do is going to help us uh, be able to uh, clean up and manage our data that we have in there. Um, right now, there, we have a lot of customizations that are built in to help us report to the state and other uh, areas, and the customizations limit us into the support we can have and uh, other entities helping us extract the data and actually you know, pumping the data out to where we need to go. So with this uh, update, we're now able to have the ability to hide and lock fields, which is going to allow us to uh, move it around into the fields that were designed to work in PowerSchool. We have a lot of data and fields that were, like I said, customized that just don't map uh, properly to where they need to go. This is gonna allow us to kind of get back to, uh, I hate to say basics, because it's far from basic, but uh, back to where the data should be residing. So this is gonna help us get to that point. Um, a lot of grade book uh, upgrades as well, functionality added to that. Uh, one of the downfalls of PowerSchool up until this version was uh, you know, especially at semester and uh, quarter end, students moving classes and courses. It was really cumbersome to have to leave a kid in a course, change them at the proper time once we are about to store grades. This is gonna allow us to have kind of a copy and paste function where you can just take the grades from one section and move it into the other, his new section or his or her uh, new course and whatnot. So a lot of functionality that we're gaining from this which is gonna make all of our lives easier, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get Power School to work for us and not us uh, work for Power School, so to speak. Um, we're also in the midst of uh, finalizing all the scheduling for uh, 1920. Uh, we got a, a good step in there to create the courses that we needed and update the number of sections and the teachers and all that fun stuff that goes along with it. it was, uh, my first time ever being exposed to it, it's a really, 
really in-depth process that involves uh, everybody around, you know, with Lori Ferreira creating the master schedule and, and working with Mike Boucher and just a lot of learning went on and it certainly is a uh, in-depth process that, you know, you want as many eyes looking at it to make sure it's right so down the road all the data is correct and we're not surprised by anything, uh, you know, things such as honor roll and GPA and stuff like that. So uh, it's an in-depth process that we are uh, working through very diligently. Um, on from PowerSchool, um, we're working on uh, budgeting items. Uh, what we're trying to do is we would like to be able to replace a server we have in-house here. Um, it's, it's aged, it's, it's served its purpose, and uh, we would really like to move on from it and uh, get a newer uh, bigger, better server in there. Um, it's one of our main servers that houses and fun uh, it's a domain controller. It has all the uh, links to some of our third party uh, items and we just want to make sure that we're staying up to date so we can provide the service that we want to our staff and students. Um, been working with uh, Don a little bit um, with the uh, construction managers getting ready to plan or planning and being ready for when we have access to these new buildings. We'll be relocating one of our uh, server clo um, telecom closets, um, specifically the one over here in the Science Vivarium. Mm -hmm. We moved into a new construction area and we were making sure we're all uh, well and good for that move um, shortly after school ends this year. Um, um, one of the other things that we would like to uh, plan a budget for is something that we've had experienced uh, you know, just before the new year. We had some power issues and the you know, <coughs> battery backups ran out of power and students were not able to get online with their Chromebooks outside of here. Um, that is because those students, when they're not here, they are filtered back into the school to go through our filter for content filtering and such and with the power being out, um, that was lost. So what we want to do is we have the ability to uh, bring in a second firewall to create some high availability. We can put it in one of the other schools, do the routing and configuration needed so it is always up and running. Um, as well as to help that, to further advance that, to keep uh, make sure everybody is online, we have um, an option to move our filtering into the cloud. And that's something we're also looking to explore and budget for. Um, that would be another tremendous way to make sure that the students don't lose connectivity um, when they are not here. Um, lastly, you know, us in uh, the tech department, we're just constantly uh, working on trying to keep up to date with everything happening um, in technology, being aware of the software programs and what needs to be done to keep things up and going and we're just always just trying to you know provide that consistent and quality customer service to our our clients which are you know the student staff and administration and that's uh, kind of in a nutshell what we have going on at this point and um, as always if you ever had any questions um, feel free to reach out to me I'll happily answer them for you Anybody have any questions now? Michelle? Um, two. Um, the first one, so you said you updated, you were able to update PowerSchool to the latest version, and it was all successful, no, yes. nothing was lost, or? Nope. That's great. No, nope, we, did, we did, just to do that, uh, to elaborate on that, one of the new functions that would have been in everybody's face is a contacts uh, portal um, that would have, I think throwing everybody into a tizzy. Um, we just weren't able to train everybody on that. And we're kind of actually using that as, um, we were able to install a plugin shortly after the upgrade, which kind of makes the PowerSchool look go back to the version that we were on. And it kind of hides a few fields that was gonna, that's what's gonna allow us to do that work. <laughs> To but the logins are the same for the students yes. and the parents and all that yep. stuff and all the None data that you had before transferred over. That's, yep. that's good news. That would have been a nightmare. <laughs> 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 um, the other thing I wanted to ask, because you were talking about software, I was just wondering, you know, with the new privacy, data privacy stuff in the state of Connecticut, I, they have a, a website, yes. right, where they 
clear, you know, with the cleared vendors. Mm -hmm. Are you finding that most of what we wanted is there, or what kind of a challenge or issue? Yeah, to, to be honest, I, that's probably one of the, <coughs> one of the things that I work on the least. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, even, even if it's on an approved list, we still have to get our own separate contract from every single. It's, <coughs> it, it's cumbersome. It's it is. It is <coughs> something that we're trying to work with the legislation on because when every single district, all 169 of us have to replicate efforts mm -hmm. to do this. It's, it's really an exercise in futility. So um, we have been, there is a running list on our website because that's part of the laws. We have to indicate what we currently have in contracts. Um, there are some who are more difficult to work with than others. Um, so we're constantly also looking at, there are some waivers by the state if it's something that the teachers are using and we're not using student data in it. Oh. We are constantly evaluating some of those things, okay. um, but it is as soon as our students go on, as soon as they have a login, we have to make certain we have a contract. Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. Our school sign. <laughs> what? Nick, could you just um, if highlight for us for a second what parents could expect as far as a new look or a new feature that PowerSchool would um, would now provide them. Um, I don't necessarily uh, know or have read anything that like the parent portal would have anything new in it, um, any new access or anything like that. One thing I have learned in these last uh, six to eight months of uh, diving into PowerSchool right. is there are features that we do have in there that uh, can be turned on or turned off. It's, it's very uh, granular in what can be shown and whatnot. So in other um, words, I know one of the things we had heard about was maybe a GPA calculator that PowerSchool enables. Uh, PowerSchool does calculate GPA. Okay. I mean, it is in there based on the criteria that um, has been set in there. It, it is there. Um, I know uh, the counseling department has been working diligently on that, double checking, making sure the math is all right with the calculations that are coming out of our school. Right. But we and do have the ability to turn on the field, yes. Okay. Now, so that is forthcoming. That should be, if not now, within the week or so. Within the week. Okay, great. Okay. And then you had specifically mentioned, I think, um, uh, in terms of. Um, honor roll, uh, and I think you, you might have mentioned a couple other features that you were looking at specifically for uh, power school. It, it, how is that um, better than it had been in the past? So, um, so what it is, it's, it's where the data lies, where, where we are finding it. Um, in making sure, um, so as part of the, the grade book upgrades and, and such, we kind of have a time frame between a marking period ending and when grades are stored. And we're, we're in limbo because PowerSchool won't calculate anything that's live. We need to do a storing of the grades under the proper term before we start getting those calculations. So what happens is in that time frame, teachers can still uh, alter the grade of their students based on work being handed late, you know, if somebody had an, uh, an incomplete and such, a teacher can still change those grades on their own. So for us to calculate that honor roll at the day of the quarter ending or the semester ending, we're not getting accurate data. One thing the upgrade will help us do is we can then freeze the teacher's grade books until we store them, where at that point we can then run those calculations at a sooner date to the quarter ending. So that's where we'll be helped with that. And, and if, um if the student is making up work, let's say, uh, after the marking term is over for a quarter, let's say, uh, is it easier now for uh, a teacher to, to make that change? In other words, um, I know at many schools there's a, there's a form that a teacher might yes. have to fill out with the registrar, and, and it's fairly simple. So, so I, I actually think it might be a little bit harder in this case, only because in that time frame of a quarter ending, to, I think it was 10 school days afterwards that the grades would be, uh, the student was allowed to make up those days and then if you add in snow days and things like that, that gets pushed back. That's just that much longer before the grade is stored. So typically what would happen, the grade book would stay open. 
Um, I would like to, to eliminate any confusion and whatnot and have the, those changes being made centrally. We would lock those grade books then and the teacher would then fill out that form. Whereas the, the last two quarters, which is my only experience, you know, that was 10 days the teacher had to change the grade themselves. So now we would lock it sooner and force the, that uh, grade change request form to come through. Seems less chaotic that way. I agree. It's it's more work on one end, but I agree it's less chaotic and it's more manageable. And there's not too many hands in the pot. I have a, just a follow up on. Did you say honor roll? But that so Paris would like calculate GPAs. It will also then determine a, uh, who qualified for what honor roll. Yes. Yeah. There is a uh, set of criteria that was already been in there based on. Well, what the school requires, right. um, it's, it's there. Uh, I couldn't recite it, uh, okay. but yes, it's in there. And the logic uh, is there. Yep. And it will count that. Yep. And once the grades are stored, we can then click calculate the honor roll, mm -hmm. and it would then um, give us who qualified for high honors and honors. Sorry, I'm pestering you with a lot of, a lot of misery. Um, is there standardization? Uh, of what, let's say, weight, um, what a summative or what a formative assessment would be, um, or do teachers are they allowed to decide at the beginning of the year what they're going to, how they're going to weight a, a formative or a summative? Um, I'll be honest, I'd be lying if I spoke to anything on that. I really don't deal much with the grading and the school side of things, but I do know just from my experience looking at grade books. You know, the teachers have their assignments and they are color coded within the grade book as formative, summative, and such. And I, I'd be lying if I told you that it was a standard across the board what they were weighted for or if it was based on the teacher uh, individual. Departments, departments, departments um, standard within it, but it is one in which it is teacher. Uh, they talk about it, make the decisions as far as what is the weight. Okay, so in the, in the syllabus of the individual teachers. Yeah, you, you can't, I don't, I don't think, if you go into power school, um, I don't think you can actually see, like, you know, uh, what the weighting criteria would be for a given test or, right. you have to go back to the syllabus and then cross-reference it yourself. Very good. Awesome. Come back thank more you, often. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Yeah. All right. We have our next guest. Floor is yours, sir. Rich, did, was there anything you wanted to set up? Or? I was going to say, you should be on the computer. I think it was supposed to be set I up for you. I tried it out before, and it worked fine. All right. Was RIT, RIT, I was going to say, guys, well, so he walked out. Guys. I don't know. <laughs> I'm on my own now. So just bear with me. I had this all set before and it disappeared, so. Because there's nothing on the screen. <laughs> no, while you're setting this up, I'll talk quickly if that's okay. okay. I'm gonna set your yep. stage, Rich. Um, all right. <laughs> Rich came in early in the school year and we had a conversation about the DARE program that we have, which is our drug resistance education program, um, currently done for our fifth grades. And one of the things Rich talked about early on is it's, one year and then you know good luck the rest of your time and <laughs> taking a look at things that we need to do to continue the conversation um, and also recognizing deer really doesn't have the impact some of the um, 1980s films lose their edge at times and trying to take a look at what is relevant to our students today what are things that are happening um, with resistance that we need to look at what are social media we have to take a look and say that there's new drugs on the market. They're the designer prescription pill epidemic in the opioids. And so making certain that we're creating a program that really starts to tailor and speak to what are the needs for the resistance for today. And so Rich had worked with uh, a number of different police departments, looked at DARE, um, and also recognizing DARE took a, a significant amount of training and wasn't going to give us 
some of the um, education that we were looking for. So uh, Rich was able to work with some of his colleagues, uh, come up with a new idea, and that's what we'd like to present today, where we'd like to take that next level of drug education for our students. Um, and again, it's this becomes about relevance more than it's something in which we're saying we have a fear, there's not a knee jerk, this is to be well thought out and uh, again, responsive to what's happening in our culture today. Well, I can't set up a PowerPoint <laughs> that you expected. <laughs> I used to Google uh, Sheets. No slideshow on top? You can't put the well, we arrow, arrow. <laughs> whoever in the arrow. It's, it's set up so it doesn't mirror the displays. Oh. Um, anyway, I'll start anyway. Hmm. I pretty much have met everybody here. My name is Rich and I'm on the SRO for Region 12. What Megan just said is I have a narcotics background prior to me being the SRO here. I was a narcotics detective in Waterbury for my last 10 years there, serving on a bunch of different task forces that did um, in this region. You know, not only Waterbury, I was in New Milford, um, Danbury. So right now I'm a drug identification instructor to new recruits at the police academy. So with that being said, I'm always up on the current drug trends. So with this new program, when we, when we have DARE, we're married to that program. We have to use the curriculum that they give us. And it's 10 classes that's in the fifth grade, and some of it really just doesn't apply to our region. I, I, I see some classes going, going to waste because we really don't have a gang problem here in Region 12. Um, Good job. You know, <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is with, with this new program, talking to other SROs in the region, <laughs> Talking, talking to other police officers, trying to want to keep the core components of DARE as far as the life skills mm -hmm. of making the right choice, peer pressure, bullying, but we want to use, we want to take that and we want to kind of tailor it to, to what's unique to our area and what's unique to a fifth grader now going up to, go, going up to middle school and what he or she may face. And I really wish this would come up. It would help me so much. <laughs> Anybody a PC person? I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. Try it in the page down and see if it works. Yeah. What's well, inside yeah. the display, under the display, under the display? I think it was this. I didn't set it up for the other remote. Yeah. There's a remote where it takes over. Here you are, you moved this up to the front, I'm taking everybody's time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's a expand on is the commercialization and the targeting of, of kids with the new edibles, with, with the candies, uh, with, with the gummies, and that really worries me. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we could sit here all night arguing pro or, pro or against, and I think we can all agree that we don't want our kids doing it. Kind of going hand in hand with the vaping, because now the vaping, it, 
he yeah. can incorporate the marijuana into it. Talking to other SROs in the region, we're going to face the baby. That he helped with that. you could get away. Huh? <laughs> we'll come up on the screen. <laughs> Presentation one. Yeah. Throw a slideshow. Oh, you want to ask? Yeah, yeah, so so you you gotta make it as big as possible for us. We're set up differently. Yeah. Like this key doesn't. I can give you the angle. Yes. Okay. What the? I sign. Can I just bring a chair? Can I just Right, he gave me something to sign. I signed it, and he did. He'll send that to us. Oh, I actually went to Walmart and said, No, I'm not saying I think I get a sign with him. When it first came out, I Greg, yours is on the desktop already. Okay. Hope I can get there. <laughs> All right, so part of our transition away from there. Our approach is to keep core components of there and also to focus on the trends and challenges that are specific to our region. There is standardized to be relevant to a wide spectrum of communities, thus creating situations where certain time blocks of instruction are not put to the best use and the content is not necessarily relevant to our current audience. More of like a, a cookie cutter type of program. There ends at the fifth grade level without any further reinforcement with a total of 10 lessons. The new current model has a total of eight instructional lessons at the fifth grade level and two reinforcement lessons in the sixth grade. So we're not saying, you know, good luck in middle school. Well, <laughs> you know, we're not going to we're not going to talk to you again. Come see me if you need. <coughs> fifth graders are really at the top of their elementary as the elementary food chain, <laughs> and they quickly go back to the bottom when they enter middle school, where they're once again experiencing varying degrees of uncertainty and insecurity. New challenges that come with the new physical and social environment, and often this is when they're most susceptible to peer pressure. This new model of instruction will allow us not only to reinforce old lessons learned, but to tailor our approach and our content to the challenges of the new environment and the children's current phase of development. So, as far as the course content, the fifth grade is a, is a focused approach, responsible decision making, peer pressure, internet safety. And then the main core is the drug education, with a focus on current drug trends, drug trends specific to our region and specific to <coughs> age group, being marijuana, tobacco, with the, I'll put the vaping right, right next to that, alcohol, prescription drugs, and opioids. The sixth grade reinforcement approach, you're coping with stress, social media, as now everybody's coming up, and you know, with the Snapchat, and the, constantly facing that as a, everyday struggle and then again with the drug education just building on what we already taught in the in the fifth grade um, I'm using a lot of information from drug free world they're they're great and they have a lot of great instructional videos they're they're kind of to the point um, not all of them are appropriate maybe for fifth grade but I have a sample one here and uh, I like to show you real quick it won't take up too much time
Yeah. Of course it didn't work. <laughs> 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 I had this all set up. We even tested it. No, that was the wrong one. Oh, <laughs> that one looks ready to go. I know, it's not a picture and a play button. This one's looking a little... I don't like this one. Let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> it was all set to play, honestly. If if you if we can't get on tonight, I, I do want the board and I will send out the link because it is a little bit edgier than what it is. It it does have past users and it has them talk about some of their experiences. It does, you know, it, it does talk about um, things that happen because of addiction. And so as far as it's not as soft in just um, leaving the kids to question why, it starts to talk about how it impacted their lives. And so I think that it really does catch you. I can tell you I put my own fifth grader at home in front of it just to see how she, and there were points in which there was a little shock, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't um, anything that, um, damaged her. It wasn't anything that caught her. It was enough that it sparked conversation. Um, it was something in which, um, to say, it really gave her another perspective that started to say, this is where it goes so Good job. You, go. got it. you can prove me a liar of this. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go. <coughs> this is great. Their videos are, are, are great. And I, I tried them at home with, with my 15-year-old and really it made it it was around when I was 13 or 14, and you kind of find yourself trying to pick and choose your friends, and also at the same time, you know, you're not really worried about what you want to accomplish at that time, but what people you want to hang out with. I wanted to fit in. I wasn't a popular kid in school, and it made me forget about all that. And I'm like, oh yeah, everybody else is doing it, so I'm gonna do it. Friends were doing it. They just wanted to jump right in and have fun. I did drugs because it seemed like it was fun. But it was the cool thing to do. The cool thing to do was to get high, go to parties. Growing up, you know, you're struggling. Couldn't deal with life. So I didn't have to deal with life. I wouldn't listen to anyone. It was stubborn. Like as a rebellious thing. This is what the rebel kids were doing. I just want to see what it was like. I started experimenting with it. Experimenting with friends. First tried it because I was bored. I was always up to try something new. You know, when I was growing up, we had this program that was just say no, just say no. People are just saying no, but they're not saying why. It's like telling a person no, and then they go do it. Sparked my interest on drugs. I knew that they were bad, and I always heard about this addiction, but I didn't know what it meant. That's probably the number one reason why I did drugs in the first place. I just didn't know. Drugs are everywhere. They're in magazines, movies, uh, TV shows, you know, billboards. They're all over the place. You know, in the movies they make it look they make it look cool, but in real life it's not cool. It's uh, it's a serious problem. And a lot of times they try to glamorize drugs, like make drug dealers or getting high look cool. But that's only in the movies. In real life, it's a whole different story. All drugs, whether we're talking about alcohol, marijuana, LSD, these are all essentially poisons. It would depend on the amount that you take. I mean, a lesser amount might just speed you up, make you feel really active. A stronger amount or a stronger dosage would act as a sedative, make you slow, sluggish, tired. And even more amounts would kill you if you have an overdose. Every drug works in these stages. It's only really the amount needed to make the effect that's the difference from drug to drug. A person who's taking drugs, whether for physical pain or just to try and block off any sensations they don't want to feel, those sensations are actually just being pushed away and getting worse and worse. You're going to be totally numb and just not be able to feel anything. When you take drugs, the drug goes through your bloodstream and later on in your life, that drug can 
you know, come back up and into a flashback when you use the drug. You could have taken LSD one day and like a year down the road it could come back into effect and you can start hallucinating again. And it's not just LSD, it's every drug. So you can get hit with the effects of a drug even a long time after you stop taking them. Drugs definitely affect the mind. Uh, everything you see around you is different than what's really going on. You can't hear correctly, see correctly. All of your senses are totally thrown off. Your perception is definitely distorted. It makes it dangerous for you and others because you don't know what's going on. You can't handle things you know, the way they're supposed to be handled. Drugs affect your memory so much. It doesn't matter if you're taking them for a long time or just a short period of time. I know like when I first got like, tried studying and stuff more, like I really couldn't concentrate, couldn't pay attention. I went from like a straight A student to like, you know, a B minus student, C student. Then I quit going to school and I would get really frustrated. It's like your brain won't function. You can't think straight. Like everything is messed up. I never got anything done. I would start on something and I wouldn't finish it. it just didn't happen. It was just unbearable. I, I couldn't deal with life at all. I couldn't get a job because I was like just out of it completely. My decisions were based off of, you know, what this drug is telling me to do rather than, you know, what I want to do. I got them from friends in school. Two friends. A friend of mine. And my older brother's friends. Bunch of girlfriends. Boyfriend. Ex-boyfriend. Older guy. My dad. My cousin. My brother. My older sister. Older kids. My buddy just said, you know, you can do it every once in a while, be no problem. Told us it was going to be the best thing we've ever done. You can do it once, you'll be fine. It's not going to hurt you, really. It's just a little pick-me-up. You can't get addicted to it. They said it's not something that you're going to be taking every day. It's just something that you can take when you want to have fun. Oh, this is going to be a fun time. It's a fun drug to be on. Uh, it makes you easier to talk to girls. And they said it'll bring you up. It's going to make you feel different. It's going to, you're going to like it. You're going to feel good. It's all in your face. But that's, that's the thing to do. All it is is taking a drug dealer's word for it. When you're trying to get someone hooked, you'll say whatever you can to get a customer. You're lying for them to believe you so you can make money. I would tell people it's fun, makes you energetic, makes you more likable. It's something you know, people want to be around. Tell them whatever they wanted to hear in order to pick that first one up. You know, when I was 12 years old, I didn't say, hey, I want to be 24 in rehab. I never said that to myself. You know, but that's what became true. You know, and I never thought about it when I was when I was 13 years old. I started smoking pot. I was that kid that started out with marijuana and played around with certain party drugs, and whatnot. And I told myself specifically that I would never do certain things, cocaine, heroin. And it only took a short time for me to finally accept it and be like, okay, I'll try that. I had no idea where it would lead me to almost dying, to stealing. Lying, cheating, ruining relationships didn't matter. I didn't get into sports. I didn't get into the clubs. I didn't even go to prom. It left me with uh, living on the streets without a family, you know, and it's, is that what I set out to be? No, you know what I mean? I was just set out to have a good time at college parties. The drugs robbed me of all the pleasure of life. The drugs took away my family. The drugs took away my girlfriend, my friends. I looked back on five, six years of my life saw that all I had done is absolutely just ruined incredible opportunities that I had to have success and hurt all the people around me. It's not just something that's going to affect tomorrow, it's going to affect forever. You don't have to find out every, you know, everything for yourself. You don't have to find out what a car accident experience is like. Do yourself a favor. Don't fall into the same footsteps as so many other people have. And realize that you could be the guy living under the bridge shooting heroin. You might think you won't get like that. None of us ever did, and we wound up in those same shoes. What I would tell people is just, I would give them my story. I would tell them my exact story. I would tell them my story. A story like mine. Insanity, my story. Ultimately, it comes down to their own decision making. You have to get the facts, check the statistics, find out for yourself. Find out for yourself. Find out the actual truth of, of what these are and what they're going to do to your life. I would just say to anybody, you know, if you're going to do something, you know, if you're really going to do something, Go educate yourself on it beforehand. I think there's a lot of truth in that. And what he just said at the end is exactly what we're trying to do with this, is educate the truth. There are some cutting edge videos, but they're not. Of course, we pick the ones that are age appropriate. They're, there's lessons in here that I don't think that we're gonna 
go go forward with, like I said, the crystal meth, the things, the things of that nature. I'm going to focus in on the marijuana, the op opioid crisis that, that we're in the midst of now, and um, vaping and alcohol. And that coupled with the, the lesson of you know, making the right choice and, and peer pressure, mm -hmm. I think we could deliver a better message than just the overall dare, dare model that really is good for all around the country, but not necessarily appropriate for each each uh, jurisdiction. This, I'm not gonna show this, this is um, <coughs> a marijuana effect on, on teenagers. So it's a little lengthy, I just put it in there. Um, I don't have any more. Anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Right. Um, Rich, I think it's it's great that you were thinking about both the fifth and sixth grade, and you made a good case for why those are appropriate ages. I'm wondering if you're thinking of, um, or maybe you're already doing this, something for ninth graders as well as a natural, another natural transition age. One of the models that that I looked at, at the end that this is our first year doing it. One of the models I, I did look at. They suggest in the ninth grade or smaller peer groups rather than um, a, rather than a, a classroom type or an auditorium type assembly. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we could definitely look at. Kind of working it into our advisory program. <coughs> right. Yeah. right. No? I, I had a similar question. It <coughs> simply the fact that um, a lot of this pre-planning and pre-education to prepare and, and have kids ready to um, but then the, the pressure changes um, in high school, I would imagine. And, um, uh, and I was wondering if not just the small peer groups, but if there's a plan for, I don't know, you, you really have to try to intercept before the temptation strikes. Right. But knowing that it's a little different, a little more uh, immediate, because they already will have friends at that point. Right. Um, and so is that what the peer groups tackle? Or, and on top of that, is there a whole different kind of program as opposed to just education, but really dealing with the, uh, one of the aspects of the I think it was, was giving the tools of resistance. Right. You know, and I, I imagine that's one of the good things you said you are going to keep, something like that? Right, right. We're, we're giving the tools. Part of it is dealing with the peer pressure. Um, when, when to report something versus tattling. You know, when, as the kids get older, nobody wants to, Nobody wants to be the snitch, so to speak. You know, who, who's doing what or how to do it. So we are giving them, we are giving them the tools with how to say no in a cool way, alternative ways. Mm -hmm. Right now, as far as a, a plan to go forward into the high school, that's something actually I just worked with, with with Jim in the prevention council meeting that we we're discussing along those lines. So hopefully, we we can work something out in the high school years. Right now, the plan is just for fifth and sixth grade. I don't have anything to go forward with yet that's still in the works. So we're just branching out into the sixth grade now from the fifth grade, so I don't want to <laughs> get too far ahead, but it's definitely something we like to look at. Sure. Um, just to piggyback off of that, I just think that when you're thinking long term down the road, I do think, you know, it's kind of interesting to visit 11th and 12th grade because it, for me, it's not even just the peer pressure at that point, they already have friends that are engaged yep. in the activity. And so being able to decipher what what they know and seeing some of their friends participating versus having a problem and being able to differentiate between the two and how they could intervene or how, and what, as, as a friend, as, a, as a, just a, a bystander, just watching how you, how do you tackle that with a friend? Right. And so taking that information and then carrying it forward to college as well, being able to to differentiate between the two, I think is really important. And just something that I would suggest would be really fantastic. I think it's important too. And I find with my own son at home is just getting them to open up to you. Yeah. So that may be something, you know, I could work with guidance yeah. um, because some kids may not want to open up to a police officer. Right. You know, hey, my friend is, is doing drugs. They may open up to someone else, but definitely a plan going forward for, yeah. for those ages. I, I definitely agree. Because those are tools that you'd be able, you could use, you know, now and in college and after college. And I think, I think a lot of times, even as adults, we don't realize that you know somebody's like, oh, that's a problem. Right, and at that age group, you could deliver the message mm -hmm. 
maybe a little more straightforward mm -hmm. than, than you could at a fifth and a sixth grade yeah. level. Yeah, like, and you can be really honest right. and have a discussion and not put a name to it, but just really just kind of, I just think it's something to think about. Right, right, I agree. Show. Sure. I agree. I, I was that was I was gonna say I would love to see it continue mm -hmm. throughout middle school and into high school mm -hmm. for those very reasons, and especially because I think, um, in a, 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 I don't know, if you need to our district, but anyway, it, it's um, not something that they've usually experienced or seen much of in fifth or sixth grade, mm -hmm. and it's not until later middle school, early high school, where there's catching word of this mm -hmm. and they have to dig back pretty far mm -hmm. to fifth grade you know it's not until it's relevant mm -hmm. that it really right. sinks in so right. I think hitting it again throughout is important the other thing I wanted to, to just ask you about I, I think it's great that you're updating the program I think um, with kids these days with their their phones and stuff it it's <laughs> well no, I just I think it's so good. like I think they can handle a little bit more yeah, than right. the, you know they, they've been exposed to a lot they really they have, have so great. much right there in their hands yeah. so so it's important for us to stay yeah. up with that but I know that the dare program <coughs> had a component that was a really large part of our fifth grade promotion ceremony type thing there was a, a sort of a tradition and ceremony around that which I'm not saying I, I, I'm not saying we can never change it but just to be aware and to maybe talk to the principals or I don't know if there's a component like that with this drug-free world I don't know mm -hmm. the t-shirts they all sort of I don't know they sign that. something they write a statement I, I, I forget exactly but it was it meant something to them they felt like they were sort of armed to go to the middle school somehow? You're right, we, we did discuss that. And one of the model programs is a program that Fairfield uh, Police Department used. Um, the retired chief from Fairfield now works at Bridgewater as a, as a constable. And it's called the SHAPE program. And they did a lot of that. They had t-shirts made, they did graduation ceremonies. There, there's nothing saying that we can't do that. In fact, that's something I like to come up with as we're going along in, in the program to keep everybody everybody involved. And we, we can have things made. I, I like to have a name for the program rather than mm -hmm. anti-drug. You know, <laughs> right. Perhaps we can maybe even run a contest with the kids throughout the program to maybe name this program. Mm -hmm. I was trying to come up with a catchy name for it, but then, you know, right now it's just our anti-drug program. <laughs> and I think one of the things I also applaud Rich Hoys is also thinking in terms of how we get them to be the messages out. And he was talking about having our kids do public service announcements and having that go in, and having Colin piece them all together, mm -hmm. and that will become something that's shown at all three of the right. elementary right. schools. <coughs> and again, a lot of this is also unifying our students. So mm -hmm. as silly as it is, sometimes having that t-shirt makes you feel that sense of belonging and we're together against something. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. so just a, a couple more suggestions to it. One would be um, working with the high school health teachers uh, to see how maybe you could work with them in their curriculum. I mean, mm -hmm. I imagine that they've got uh, at least one unit on, on drugs and alcohol. Right. And where I'm seeing your expertise would be some of the, the strongest um, messaging is from that one-on-one -on -one small group messaging. I'm sure you, you probably know um, recovering addicts that would be more than willing, as part of the recovery even, to come in <coughs> talk with high school classes about their own experience. How did they get started with drugs? Uh, how did it spiral out of their control? What did they think it was going to be? I mean, those are the questions that high school kids want to know. Right. And right. to hear it from um, a peer that's been there, I think is the probably the most powerful. As great as that video was, to hear it from a kid who's sitting with you in your, in your health class or in your advisory group, telling their story, that's the most powerful way you can get that message out. I agree. And I, I do work with the health teachers here and there at the high school. Great. Constantly forwarding emails of uh, current drug, gen, drug trends. Um, I even gave a couple classes at Jay Stewart's class Good. Um, regarding the vaping and things of that nature. I'm always, send, I think they get tired of my emails sometimes. I'm always sending out emails of uh, you awesome. know, you know, current drug trends. Richard, oh, good stuff. I'm sorry. Oh, um, so is this a program that you think ready to implement next year or does this take a while to like develop your curriculum because you're this is like from what i'm understanding you're tailoring it completely right. we it's not like drug free world has their own 
their program or curriculum that we're following. We, we'd be taking from a drug-free world. I wouldn't be using their whole curriculum because okay. basically their whole curriculum is drug A, drug B, drug C, drug in. I'd be taking what's pertinent to us for now. Um, Bofin light, uh, life skills, I'd be taking from them. Um, current drug trends from law enforcement, uh, the law enforcement community, and just putting it all together in individual lesson plans. So we, we can start this year. Great. I, I really want to encourage you doing this. I think this is wonderful. I, I, I had some concerns about the DARE program, and I wasn't particularly a big fan of it. But I like what, this, what you're doing here. I like the way you're sort of customizing it for the things that are going to be most relevant and are going to be most helpful here in our community. I think that's exactly the way to do it. And with your background and understanding this stuff, that's just perfect. So thank you. Thank you. More of the same. <laughs> thank you. Rich, I'd like to, uh, unless anybody else has got any other questions, I guess in closing, one, thank you for, for doing this. Uh, you know, I, I think always looking at things with a fresh set of eyes and, uh, is, is, is healthy, you know, from that standpoint. Um, I echo everyone else's comments. I, I'd like to see this develop, and I realize you've got to take that first step as a continuum across all grades. Because I think, again, the problems change, the circumstances change, but the underlying sort of data is still, or point is still the same. You know, when I think about that, the peer groups are going to change for a number of our kids when they graduate and go to college, and now they're like, now they're 18, 19 year olds trying to find another peer group to fit into. Right. Whether it's fraternities, sororities, whether it's your, your, your you know, your, your dorm floor. Fill in the blank, but it's another transition that maybe gets ratcheted up because right. things are going to happen in you know uh, fast, you know. So, um, and my my last comment was would be, what about the parents? You know, a lot of these stories start with athletes who were injured, and doctors prescribe oxy, and that's the beginning. Right. 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 And you know, and and. So you, you kind of scratch your head and say, how did that kid wind up having that problem? And it started with, this, with, with an innocent prescription, but nobody paying attention. I, I'm not being, you know, just saying, no, right? I agree. So if you can think about the parents and, and how, how do we reach them from an educational standpoint as well? Right. right. I, I have given classes in the past in, in Thomaston and both Waterbury, two, two parents. That was mainly things to look for indicators of possible drug use. Um, it's easy to say, you know, there's a pile of drugs on the table, that's, that's what it is, but just some, some indicators of things that you may see around the house or types of behaviors. That's the type of education that I, I gave to the parents, but I, as we progress there, I could definitely do, do classes for the parents as to what you, as to what you were saying. I, I reckon I, I think it would be good. I've seen police officers with that exact same thing happen that, that lost their jobs, you know, get, getting injured on duty, and then it starts with the oxys, and there goes the career because they just couldn't stop. Right. Thank you. Thank again. You. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank support. You. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So we'll pick back up uh, on the agenda. Uh, at item number four, reports and uh, recognition uh, for the chair's report. I'll be very brief, because we do have a rather uh, large, large agenda to get through. Um, I'll just say that I know the Finance Committee, and Megan, and Nicole, and staff, and a lot of people are very busy in budget season trying to get us ready for uh, next week. Yes. Uh, for the first discussion on the budget. It's going to be a very um, uh, challenging budget to introduce this year because of Ag STEM, because there's a different dynamic going on with, uh, with how the monies flow to the towns versus flow to our budget. And, uh, and I think it's really, really important that all of us um, understand what that narrative is, because it's going to require a fair amount of education to our residents don't want them walking in thinking you know the referendum for the budget is going to be up here uh, without understanding that some of that is coming back in the form of tuition you know and there's a netting effect and so um, I, I'm just saying it's like 
early now to get out in front of the process because it is going to be, um, uh, you know, and it's the first time, so it's going to be the worst time, right? Because we're going to establish a new norm, a, yeah. or a new, uh, yeah, a new norm. And, and then the year after, you're not going to be talking about this bump. So it's a, it's a, it's an important year for us. So with that, right? Wow, that was a segue. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about brighter things now. Um, and, and and I appreciate you saying that because it is, um, as we work on it, we're, we're being very mindful. We're, we're trying to be thoughtful and we want to be as transparent as possible. So, you know, next board meeting, hopefully we'll be able to discuss a little bit more. But in the meantime, um, we have some updates that I'd like to share. Um, Congratulations to Washington Primary School that was recognized as a school of distinction for the 2017-18 school year. Um, the recognition was based on student growth on standardized tests. There's physical fitness aspect to it, attendance, also gap between subgroups um, for some special education, making certain that um, we don't have gaps in some of our um, <coughs> subgroup populations. It should also be noticed Burnham School was not considered for the award. We did not have enough students as test takers to be measurable on that data point. So it's, it's a non-score. Um, on Tuesday, February 19th, our staff re uh, received training on Google Classrooms, as well as they were able to get a menu of technology options in order to explore how we can make certain we are um, bringing technology into the education process more. We're utilizing, we're looking at what are single platforms. So one of the things we are talking about is having Google Classroom replace Schoology in the future. And so we had everybody take a look. They were able to explore uh, taking, we wanna make certain that as we roll this out, it's not a surprise. We'll come back at it. This is really the time which we are asking our educators to practice, try it out play with it a little before we actually roll it out for the following school year. That being said, it's also gonna be important that we have the parent component of understanding the Google Classroom. Uh, Google Classroom has some other functionalities that we don't have at Schoology, including we can see if the students opened up the assignment. <laughs> so it's a very nice thing to say we have some additional accountability that's built in. And the other beautiful thing about Google Classroom is we already are using Google Docs we use that for our email platform. And additionally, there's no additional cost. Yes. Um, so, so we are trying to make certain we are being fiscally responsible while making certain it's educationally responsible. Um, on the 19th, the last portion of our day was dedicated to safety and security. And uh, Rich Iniamo and Emily Judd led the conversation. Emily uh, Judd has been going to all of the staff and faculty meetings to start the conversation and starting with, do we feel safe in our own schools? And taking a conversation of how are we doing with our practices? What are things that we can see that we need to do for our physical structure? Ways that um, we ourselves are looking at safety in a different way. Um, so we had the conversation, uh, we started talking about some next steps. We are going to come August, we are going to provide some new training uh, for lockdown situations. We are going to be providing tabletop discussions. We are having our first responders come. So we really are starting the new year with a new push on safety, making certain our practices are common, our language is common, that each one of the troops, the state troops that we are working with, understand what it means and we have some of our language that we're using. So we rolled that out with the staff. Um, and it was very well received. So you're hearing us turn, you know, when we're talking about changing some of the DARE programs, and we're trying to have an awareness and reflective of what is this day and age when it comes to education. So um, you will hear that now. That said, we've also talked to the staff about a lot of our practices and things that we do need to remain internal. We can't have common um, understanding of some of these things because it does compromise our safety. We look at some of these um, attacks against schools in which they use the school's own safety protocols against them. And so that becomes even more important that we're looking at, um, we, we have our own um, discretion and how we share information and what's being internal versus what we share with the public. 
So that's something in which we talked a great deal about with the staff. Um, on a later note, um, Vic talked about the Power School update. The rollover went very smooth. He did it during the long weekend. We made certain that there were no troubles when Power School rolled over. Everything looked good, which was good because it's a tenuous time of year as people are switching over their classes. So uh, I applaud Vic for, for what happened with Power School. Um, additionally, today was very windy. <coughs> I don't know if y'all noticed. Um, I, I want to thank publicly All Star Transportation because they were in communication with us. They were letting us know about road closures that were happening. They were talking to us about if they had to reroute buses. They were on top of the situation before we even dismissed. And it, it's one to know that when we have those partnerships, it makes us feel safer, safer as our children are coming and going to school. So that was wonderful. <coughs> um, we have had a lot of legislative <laughs> initiatives. Uh, <laughs> the governor's keeping us on our toes. Um, we know that he has talked about the Teachers Retirement Board and um, what's gonna become in some of our budgets. So we're keeping <coughs> that within our purview, especially as we have a conversation next week. Um, they've also had a lot of conversation about regionalization. On Friday, March 1st at one o'clock, those looking to speak about regionalization efforts are encouraged to share their thoughts in person or through submission of letters. Um, there's a lot of different ideas that are on the table. I don't know where they're going to go. Right now it's a lot of speculation. There's also a lot of things that hinder some of the towns coming together. It, it doesn't always happen so naturally. Even we know it, in our own region, there hasn't always been perfect harmony. So we also have to look at how um, the plan is gonna go forward. So right now, there's a number of different ideas on the table. So anybody looking to talk to it, there's an opportunity to have voices heard. Um, as Anthony said, we have been in full budget mode these past few weeks. I want to thank uh, Nicole Grant. Her, her efforts have been tireless. Not only is she trying to get us ready for uh, Monday, she's also been digitizing the office, <coughs> trying to get as much into our Tyler system, utilizing all of the software we have to the maximum degree. So hopefully as we move forward, it will make some of our conversations smoother. We can get information faster. So um, she has been working tirelessly and it is very appreciated. We have some very nice athletic highlights. Um, our ice hockey team won on Friday night against the Red Hawks in an exciting game. And because you all wooed, we will not talk about Saturday. So, <laughs> um, not as lucky, but it was, it was played with a lot of heart. The girls basketball team uh, will travel to East Windsor on Monday to, com uh, to compete in the first round of the CIAC tournament. In addition, um, the basketball officials group have recognized the Chappelle girls basketball team for their sportsmanship. Um, award winners this season. So it's great that they have play their hearts out, but it's even better that they have heart. So um, in addition, our boys basketball team beat Lewis Mills first round Berkshire League tournament. So exciting. I know, as a Region 10 parent. Um, no, um, <laughs> um, really, it was a great but game. It, and so at this point, uh, they are against Nanawag in the tournament semifinals at Lewis Mills on Tomorrow. Um, so yes, boys at Lewis Mills. I know. Yeah. Yeah. They're all over the place. So the boys basketball team was also recognized the past weekend as co-winners of the Berkshire League Sportsmanship Award as voted upon league coaches. So again, that speaks so highly of our programs. Um, our swim team will compete in the Berkshire League Championships on this coming Saturday at the Hotchkiss School. Hotchkiss School. All right, um, <laughs> so a couple of notifications that we have um, on February, um, what is it, February, I apologize, I wrote that down. We have a field trip coming up for our ninth grade to go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, in New York to support the Western Civilization curriculum. Um, that said, I, I did catch wind that Traditionally, we did have junior class go in the past to the Met. Uh, they will be going to the MoMA Museum in New York City. So um, that is uh, something that has been coordinated by our high school. Additionally, um, just two personnel. Oh, excuse me, yep, please. On the agenda, it says uh, grades 6 through 12. Go the typo. Oh, okay. Actually, it's, it's 6 through 
Twelve is our Chicago school. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm like, well, I'm take it I'm, I'm not gonna let. Sometimes you just write what somebody writes down. <laughs> I just thought it was a magic word day. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly it. Yes. Yeah. What? I'm sorry. Who's going to Mormon? Uh, the I have it where it's the the Junior. Right. When are they going Instead to Mormon? Instead of going to the Met, they're going. Instead to the yes, okay. yes. So they will still have a trip to New York. The juniors. The juniors. Oh. And do you know when that is? I don't know oh, yet. Okay. I just wanted to let people oh, know because okay. I'm hearing that. Oh, okay. I'm learning that potentially it looked like it was a tradition buster. So we want to make certain that people know oh. that there is still something forthcoming. So that's more of an asterisk. I got it. Um, so stay tuned for, for that information. Um, we do have some personnel information. Uh, we have a leave of absence. Uh, Laura Horgan, the secretary for Booth Free. She's been out since January. Uh, we're hoping she returns, so probably mid-March, but right now it's still to be determined. And uh, we have a resignation of Brittany Turney, the library clerk at Burnham and Washington Primary, effective March 20th this year. Did you say they could close just one? Because they did. They just wanted to they're playing at East Windsor. No? Yeah, tonight. Nice. Yeah. Oh, yay! Yay. Look at this live update. <laughs> One. All right. Awesome. Oh, that's great news. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you did it with good sportsmanship, I'm sure. That's right. <laughs> you got it? I think so. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Committee reports. Uh, I'll start by just saying that uh, there's a number uh, of bylaws. Committee continues its work. Uh, we're meeting again uh, on the 7th. Um, and one more time after that on the 25th, at which point we should be done uh, with our uh, with our sweep through all the bylaws. Uh, so we'll continue to present them to the board at each board meeting uh, as the agenda allows. Ed events? Um, yeah, so uh, just a couple updates. Um, Ed Advance hired the company uh, Hanover Research to work with all districts as requested. Um, to help with any kind of research that they might want to do. For example, if we were considering changing our school start time or we wanted to look at ways we could share services, they could help pull data for us and, and do the research. So that's um, just another resource that they're adding that we should think about if we're ever, you know, whether you're looking at population or education trends or whatever it is. Is that um, a full fee, Michelle? I think or it depends they are, on what you're no, they are increasing their um, their regular their regular tuition for us to be part of the program. Okay. So with the increased cost, they were looking to have additional services to provide to the districts. So having access to the Hanover Group is theirs. Okay. Yeah. So I don't think mm -hmm. I think it, <coughs> with our dues to in advance, if we would like to have them work on something for us, that's part of it. No. It's a new, an additional service for the additional fee. Um, I also just wanted to point out that they did, um, they worked with Winchester um, revamping their curriculum and they were recognized for having the highest increase in their math and language arts scores of any of the Alliance districts. So they've done some really good uh, curriculum work. Um, I know that um, they're continuing to expand the districts that they uh, provide food service for. Um, that's just another one of the things that they do and that we might be interested in looking at. Um, and uh, the, all of the RASCs, not just at advance, um, are talking to the education committee in the state to remind them of all of the regional, uh, regionalized things that we already do. So they're very aware of this, this um, the, the legislation that's being proposed and are um, you know, trying to help with that conversation. So uh, I just wanted to let you know that. Oh, wait, one last thing I forgot. Um, they're continuing to expand their special ed offerings. Um, uh, spaces, so send, for, for districts to send their students who have special ed needs that they can't meet in districts so that they don't have to send them so far. So they, uh, they've been having some building issues, um, in, but they have programs in Danbury, programs in Torrington, so not too far for us. So it's, it 
just another place that it advance continues to expand. That's it. Thank you. So <coughs> 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 Not much happening this <laughs> 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 What do we do? No, it's like February has been like a finance committee party. We had at, at least four meetings since the last board meeting. Um, three of those were for <coughs> budget proposal presentations. Um, and the structure of those didn't change much this year. We kind of kept up with what we've been doing in previous years. Um, although we did meet earlier in the day, which I think kept us all a, a little more bright. Pete was firing on all four cylinders. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. um, no, but, but truly, I think it led to more lively discussion and participation. And, we got some um, community members coming in. Um, Barbara Henry from Roxbury was there. Uh, Curtis Reed from uh, Bridgewater was there. Um, we even had some teachers participate, which was great. Um, and I mean, each, each of those meetings lasted at least two hours. Uh, and we came away with some more in-depth knowledge about just how the district funds are being utilized and also led into some good discussions about um, how we're working, how we can do more with what we have, and even kind of dipped into some long-range planning, which I'm sure the committees will discuss soon enough. Um, we are going to meet again as a committee at the end of this week to review the monthly and year-to-date financials. And I know uh, Megan and Nicole are nearing the end of their preparations for the superintendent's budget presentation on Monday. Um, the fourth meeting we had was to review the debt service structure for the bond that we're issuing, um, and the committee's ready to make a recommendation to the board, which is later on in the action items, so I'll discuss that a little bit more in depth in a little bit. Um, but I do want to say that just over the last month, being able to work more closely with Nicole has just been so impressive in what she's been able to accomplish and dive into and educate us on even in the last four weeks that you've been here, including snow days and holidays and all sorts of like breaks and stuff. Um, but she's, she and Megan have tackled the supplier portal for the grant submissions and the reimbursements from the state. Um, again, the bond and ban, ban financing, which she dove into further, really sharpening her pencils on um, what Bob left us with, which was a great standing, but to, to go in and ask more questions and talk to our financial advisor and sharpen our pencils and get us to um, an even better point it was just, it's great. Um, working on the budget proposals, monitoring the current operating budget. Um, just, I can't, can't say enough good things about her. And if you all get the opportunity to talk to her, she's amazing at educating and explaining. And um, there's a wealth of knowledge there that we've, I think everyone on the committee has been really impressed with. So, um, yeah, we've, we've got a lot on our plate, and we're still moving, and we've got more to talk about later on the agenda. So, uh, no one has questions. Thank you. For committee wants to have anything. Thank you. Yep. Great. Facilities. Uh, the Facilities Committee met tonight. We had three topics on the agenda that we discussed. Actually, one on the agenda that we added to. One of them is a parking issue that was brought up. Um, that we, I don't know if any of you have had the great fortune to be here <laughs> for a meeting on a night when there's an athletic or another major event going on. Uh, but apparently, everyone is completely unaware that there's a lot of parking spaces in the North Lot. And as a result, they, they jam this lot. And I had I came out of a building committee meeting one night, and I had parked down here where the handicapped spaces used to be but no longer are. And I parked in a marked space. And, I, and, and someone came and parked their gigantic SUV right in front of me. So if, if my head is right, if my lights are here <laughs> facing out, they park right there leaving me just enough room by an inch on either side to squeeze out between them and the other car. I mean, there's just a horrific parking situation going on there. So, we're going to see what we can do about trying to direct people, or at least give them signage to let them know that there is parking in North Lot. Although, in, in a short time, they're going to completely change that arrangement uh, there. Uh, because we are, we are going to, they're almost finished. They're almost finished laying the, um, the, the sanitary and uh, also 
um, storm sewer lines mm -hmm. underneath or, or next to what will be the road, the final road that's going in over there. And once that's finished, they're going to they're basically going to reopen the whole bottom end of the hill, and they're going to move the, the tape closer to where the, 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 the um, tennis courts uh, have been. So they're they're, they're going to move. The, they're going to be moving that whole thing and changing the whole arrangement as it goes through. So look forward to that. Uh, but at the very least, we're going to try to get some signage up to let people know there's parking here so we can solve that problem. Can I just piggyback too? But I also think that it's really important to make sure that the buses that are coming in from other districts, yes, that, too. that they have another place to park. So even when we move, because they're getting stuck um, and the cars are getting stuck and it's mayhem. So wherever people are parking, there needs to be designated spots for the buses to go. I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to, Matt Parachi did email all of our, our competing towns, mm -hmm. so to say. And they were given instructions on how to, but I can tell you as enforcement, we need to also I was get it has to be enforced because I mean, two times I had to go in to get cars moved so buses can come in and out. And I think that there needs to be enforcement here at the parking lots um, on a regular basis, especially when there's events going on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think what people do is as people enter the building for the games, they'll be handed a little piece of paper that will say, uh, every night, if, if you park inconsiderately, every night we tow one car. <laughs> Tonight it could so be yours. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Different okay, so so the next uh, and, and that's a, that's a critical issue. We've got to fix that. The, the next item on the on the agenda that we talked about uh, is a letter that um, the building committee had received and. Uh, from the town fire marshal of Washington, um, and it, it had to do with, with uh, extra supply of water. The, for reasons I'm going to tell you about momentarily, the building committee declined to act on it uh, because it was not within its, its area of what, what it's been assigned to do. W what it is, is that as the new areas of the building are worked on, the science labs, the interior north area, the renovations, the, the north wing addition that's going on the building and the, and the animal building, all of those new areas are going to be sprinklered. And we have made provision for installing tanks, 30,000 gallon tanks in the ground to provide storage of water so that it can run the sprinklers. So the point of the sprinklers is to increase the amount of time that we can get people out of the building in the event of fire. And so the idea, is, that's the idea. So the fire marshal came to us a few meetings ago and said, he says, you know, that's all fine. I've signed off on it. You're good with that. But I'm not happy that uh, once you use that water in those sprinkler systems to, to fund, make those sprinklers work, there won't be any water left over in that new system to fight fires in the rest of the building. Well, there isn't now. Um, when this building was built in 1970, the only source of water storage to fight fires is the pond. And the pond, and, and so the fire marshal was looking for us to add a 30,000 gallon reservoir in order to do that. Well, that's an expensive proposition. Um, and the pond has 250,000 gallons of water in it. Uh, so one thing we, we, we looked at in the, the building committees, we said, well, what if we were to create a hydrant system so we could take water, we could tap the pool that's 150,000 gallons. Rather than putting a 30,000 gallon tank in the ground, can we tap the pool with 150,000 gallons? Well, we can. The problem is, it's got to be eight inch PVC, a very special scheduled PVC pipe. Um, you have to empty the pool in order to connect it to the internal pool system for, to do it. Bottom line is, it's about a 50 to $70,000 thing. Now, the building committee is dealing with what is the Ag7 Science Lab projects. This water is necessary not because of the Ag7 Science Labs, but because there's some residual unhappiness with the pond. Uh, partly its location, partly the fact that it's a pond, and partly because they have to get the water over, they have to get to it in order to hook up to it to get water from it. So there's a variety of reasons. So we're trying to be accommodating, but it's completely outside of us because we're never going to get a penny in state reimbursement for this. And we can't do it. It's not in our power. So I said, I've got a letter that should be sent to the fire marshal uh, where I'm telling him that that's the situation. It doesn't apply. 
However, we're sending it to the Board of Education. The Board of Education is going to act on this request. What he proposed is maybe while we got the ground open, we ought to install some pipes so that in the future we might be able to tap the pool. And I think that the, and, and the sensibility of the building committee, we discussed it tonight, is we're, we're recommending that we look, in, that you look into that. And in order to look into it, we have more information to gather before we can put it in front of you for action. Yeah. Why can't they use the um, pump thing that they drop in when there isn't a hydrant? I've seen them use it on the, on the river before. Um, is that not did, a... There, to pump water from where? The pool. Oh, well, they could do that in a heartbeat. The problem is the pool is inside the building. And I, this is not been expressed to me, but I would imagine that if for whatever reason the fire is where you enter the building near the pool, it might be difficult to get to the beach initially. But I'm thinking that under, the under the circumstances where they had a fire to fight in this building, they could probably easily tap the pool. The pool building itself is a building that is largely masonry. Uh, it's got hard surfaces and it's got 150,000 gallons of water in the water. So it's not the kind of building that tends to, to go. And it has exterior doors. It has exterior it's, doors. I, but I you, mean, the pool's not going to be on fire. You, the pool itself, but you. you Bottom line is, no, yes, there's multiple ways to do it, all of which have been suggested. And what we're going to do is we're going to look to see, because the other thing is, is he doesn't really want the hydrant to come out where the pool is. He wants it to be brought up about 100 feet or so. so can we further closer? Can I suggest we, we, we uh, sorry, it, it, we're going to be talking about this again. Right. Yes. Yeah, so so, so we're only let, let us develop the information. Let Greg go back to the homework. What, what I just wanted to let you in on it because you know obviously it's a concern. We want to make sure this building is is as safe as possible. But right now we've got a viable system that's been used for 47 years, and what we're trying to do is figure out is if it's economically feasible. Is this a couple of thousand dollars to install this pipe in the ground, and then maybe in the future, when the because just to empty the pool and refill it is eight thousand. Eight nine thousand dollars. So maybe when the pool is empty the next time, you can then install that piece, and then eventually you can hook them. So there's a process. We're looking into it to see what we can do. We we want to make the building as safe as possible, and we want to we want to try to accommodate what the fire marshal is talking about. So we'll be back to you with further information. But I didn't want when I came back for that to be the first time you heard it. So that's what I want to tell you tonight. The third item on our agenda is our capital budget, and uh, we. Um, through some hard work by uh, Don O'Leary, uh, he has managed to find some savings uh, in some of the items in the capital budget. I'm not going to detail the capital budget, but I'm just going to tell you that um, with an initial budget proposal of $923,050, he's got us now proposing $430,300. Uh, some items, about 123,000 is going to be bumped into future years, things that don't have to be done immediately. And then there are a number of items that he's, been man he's managed to bring some savings out of by not relying primarily on consultants and instead coming up with uh, alternate sources of information on how we can solve those problems for half the price. So there's, there's a number of things like that. But here's something I want to tell you about this. I know we want to try to, you know, this is a strategic aim to try to keep from spending as much money as we can avoid spending. But the difficulty we've got is the more items we, we push down the road, we're pushing them into years when the numbers are going to get bigger. It is not going to be cheap to run three elementary schools and a high school, and a middle high school. And so we need to, we need to take cognizance of that. And there are going to be tens of millions of dollars that will have to be spent in order to do this. Uh, this building alone is, is expensive. But the elementary schools, in some ways, are even more expensive. But when you see the budget, the initial budget proposal um, had two elementary schools well in excess of the cost of just Chapa's capital budget. Uh, two of the three elementary schools were well in excess of Chapa's capital budget. So there's a lot of work out there that needs to be done. I just want you to be prepared for that, be ready for it. And ultimately, what's going to come is not just a given year's capital budget, but what it's going to look like for the next 20 years. And I hope you don't fall over when we see what that number is. But you know, for, whatever, for better or worse, we have chosen a system in which we have old buildings and we're going to maintain it. And this is what it's going to cost. Now we're going to look at what it's going to cost.
So that's what the facilities committee has been up to. Not that much going on. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, well, negotiations? Negotiations. We are currently, we're going to mediation with the union that we've been negotiating with, representing the paraprofessionals and clerical workers. That mediation, I think, has been scheduled for the 21st of February. Um, by March, right? The 21st of March, I'm sorry. Um, and, and so we're going to be going to the mediation plan. Sure. Um, we met this evening and we have um, a policy on the agenda, so I will just wait until then. Okay. All right, AgriScience. All right. Um, so we reviewed all 75 applicants for AgriScience. Uh, we sent out 52 acceptance letters today. So we are very excited. We have students from each one of our sending towns. Um, additionally, we do have a wait list that we are able to access in the event that students have made other decisions for their high school experience. But to say, um, again, looking at the, the students, the applicants that were out there, what they're able to offer our schools, what our school is able to offer them. It is very exciting. So hopefully um, we have some very excited students within the next couple days. They have until March 13th to make their decision and uh, let us know so that way we can make those decisions, finalize, get them up and going, get all of the information we need to so they feel like Chicago students. Um, the Furniture, Fixtures, and Equipment Grant was reviewed by Castle Booz and our staff. We're excited about some of the changes that have been happening to the list, um, including things like putting a virtual riding horse, uh, including some additional microscopes, looking at drones that can collect some samples from our fields, and equipment that provide an immersive experience with virtual means. So. Um, one of those things we recognized early, the horse began to grow into and we'll get there so virtual. <laughs> but no, it's, um, I, I joke because we, we do have, when we're having conversations with um, some horse owners who can bring their horses on site as we continue to grow and evolve our program, but to also say, we're talking about what is 21st century learning and having that opportunity is just outstanding and so we're excited about that. Um, I do have to publicly say a very special thank you to Lori Ferreira, who um, has at this point taken care of our agri-science curriculum mapping from 9 through 12, has gotten everything in. A lot of our classes backed right into um, making certain we end at some AP level classes that we will be introducing, such as um, AP environmental science that will be forthcoming. So it, again, this is not just about our students who are coming in this year. We're looking at what does this look like years down the road. So um, as far as our assessments, we're also looking mm -hmm. at making certain they are rigorous. What are we doing that <coughs> really is showing that we're in, including that technology portion. So you know, early on we kind of took off the word STEM because I also don't want it to be that people don't think we're not doing math and science within our, the rest of our hallways, but it is one in which with everything we're developing, we're making certain that we're still keeping true to that promise that this is what this program is about. Um, additionally, uh, Kim Gallo's worked very hard with looking at the grant and where we can move ff &E to make certain that we kept our budget low when we were looking at our general budget side and what's happening with our program startup. So, um, and uh, Nicole Grant was instrumental in getting our first invoice submission to the state, as uh, Greg had noted. And so we are anticipating our first state payment next month. <laughs> it is a big yay. Um, and here we talk about all of these programs and what's next, but I also have to talk about ONG is providing our students a learning opportunity this year in a program they call ONG Builds. And actually, if I can um, invite Jim McDonough up to talk about uh, the experience that he's been having with this program. Yeah, so um, this is something that um, I was really excited about even before I knew it was a possibility. Is we were talking about living in a construction zone has a lot of challenges, mm -hmm. but it's also got a lot of opportunities. And one of the big challenges is trying to keep your students focused, especially 10th grade boys, 
when the tractors and excavators are right outside the windows, and it's, it's hard because they're more exciting than I am. Um, but I thought there's got to be a way to sort of harness this, um, you know, and, and you know, we'd have conversations. In one of my past careers, many careers ago, I was a crane operator in Chicago, so we started talking about heavy equipment operating, and you know, I would bring it back to the uh, to the um, core values and beliefs, and a lot of the things you do as an equipment operator. You know, you're engaging in creative process, you're solving problems, you're collaborating and participating with. So I just was getting kids psyched about that. And I thought, and I think we even talked about this at the groundbreaking ceremony, that there's got to be a way that even before the doors open, we could get kids sort of involved in the construction project. And lo and behold, like Megan said, ONG has a, uh, a program called ONG Builds that they piloted at Platt High School in Meriden, and they did a three-year project. And so that was a three-year project. We're hopefully gonna be a much shorter time frame. So we're gonna do sort of a, a truncated version of it. But what's gonna happen is, I have right now about 15 students who are interested. And it, these are students who might not be college bound, but might not really have a plan. And so we wanna expose them to careers and trades. Um, and so twice a month they're going to get taken out of their six period class and have sort of that lunch six period block. And the first thing we're going to do is meet with the site manager, Tim Chen, and he's psyched about the program and he's going to tell them about what his job is in the whole project and then we'll go out and do a site walk and he can sort of point out, okay, what's going on, what is my responsibility here? And then after that, every session we'll have another tradesperson, whether it's an electrician, mason, excavator, carpenter, whatever, they'll come in, they'll talk, and it won't be the lead guy, it might be, you know, the head of the job, and then somebody who's at an entry level position, and they'll come in and talk to our students about, okay, this is what I like about my job, this is what I don't like about my job, here's the salary, here's how you basically get in, and we're, we're gearing kids towards um, union type of um, pay grade, and, and like a union carpenter, or, you know, that sort of thing, not just, you know, somebody who um, puts a shingle out of front, but somebody who's working on the big projects. Uh, they've done this, like I said, at Owen uh, at Platt, and I talked to the woman who coordinated it there, and she could not have enough good things to say. They had about 20 students a year, and she knows anecdotally about five of them already have graduated and gone on to careers, good careers in the trades, who started as an apprentice um, and worked their way up through journeyman. So we're pretty psyched about that. Um, the other thing that happens is for special education, some of you might be familiar, every kid who's in special education has an IEP. And in that IEP, after they're 15 years old, we have to, by law, start doing tr transition planning, whether they're going to a four-year college, whether they're going to a two-year college, or whether they're going to the trades. We have to do things like um, career exploration inventories, we do job shadows, <coughs> we do work experience, so this fits really nicely with that. A lot of the students that we serve will be special ed, but then there's, I think about half of the kids are non-special ed. So it's gonna do a lot of different things for those kids. And uh, yeah, everybody that I've talked to is really excited about it. Um, and uh, we hope to start, with your blessings, uh, this coming Friday will be our first kickoff day. And again, if any of you would like to come and see what's going on, you're more than invited. Um, probably start at about 11.55. I'll be supervising with them throughout, so it won't just be working, you know, with people who aren't affiliated with the school. I'll be the responsible teacher <laughs> of record for the whole project. So it should be pretty neat. And I mean, it's, it's a great way to get kids involved and, and exposed to, you know, other career paths. Awesome. Nice. And it doesn't cost anything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that is great. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, question? Joe. Oh, actually, for the superintendent. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any particular reason why we only accepted 31 out of district? I mean, I think thinking that the business model would, would be better suited if we took some more out of district tuitions. Um, again, looking at the business model and taking a look at the opportunities, we did enroll in, we had a number of our own students who were interested in the program. And one of the things that we also promised was to talk about how this was going to benefit our own students too. 
there were many things that we looked at. It, there's long range planning, there are things that, how many students fit into a lab. They do get packed at 15, and so as we grow the code program, once we see that we can't sustain and accept more, certainly we want to do that, but it's also not about watering down a program to fill the spots. It's one where we want to make certain that we have that ability to grow. No, I, I know there's a, a, a nutrition rate, you know, between ninth and twelfth, but again, it seems uh, better suited that you know, uh, the greater population should be from out of district for the for the financial model. I, and I hear I hear the finances, and and yes, we do get more money when it comes to those students. Um, there's also one in which, as we're creating our relationships with those towns, um, what they are also expecting to send to and looking to make certain that we're looking to grow our relationships, not also create damaging relationships. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm sorry, Hi. <laughs> well, I can tell you that the building committee is busy spending the money. <laughs> and so it's great that we're going to get the first check from the state in two and a half weeks because at this point in time, we have spent uh, five million uh, six hundred eighty thousand of the nine million in bond anticipation notes. So if that money weren't forthcoming in a couple of months, we would be uh, out of money. <laughs> so uh, that, that's good to hear because the things are proceeding apace. And I wanted to um, I wanted to take you through a few pictures, not as many as last time. We're getting better at this. I hope this is what's coming up right now. I am the Mac office person too. Um, okay. So in the north end, this is the north end of the thing, and you see that the concrete floor was curing in this picture. This is a little bit of a while. Oh, this is a little while ago. So um, things have progressed a little further. God, these, these are really slow. This is the um, south area um, uh, where they're putting the under slab utilities. That big black barrel in the middle of that is the neutralization tank that we use for acids in the science lab. And believe it or not, it has been placed in position and it's pretty much flush with it, with a little bit, little bit of, just barely sticks out of the ground. So it's, you're, you're looking into a pretty deep trench there. Um, this is more work in the south area where they're doing the utilities. And uh, once again, a little bit more curing in the north end. Now the north end, you see they've marked out the areas where walls are going to go. And uh, you see the walls were starting to go up. Uh, this is for the food lab corner. Those walls are getting taller. More of them going up. Um, you see these little iron things being attached to the roof. That's to hold uh, uh, HVAC equipment. You see these walls are getting taller. Further progress there. Um, you see the uh, HVAC equipment is being installed. The walls now, for a large portion of the north area, go all the way to the roof deck. And um, they expect to be painting those walls within um, less than two months. And when they're at that point, they're really moving the thing along uh, into completion. Uh, this is uh, actually a, a stormwater connector that connects a lot of our stormwater as it goes out. This is the area that's going to be finished soon, and they're going to be basically reopening that area and then moving the construction more toward the athletic fields in the background there, as you see, as we continue to move up uh, that road. Um, this is more uh, stormwater work. Here is your south end, which now the trenches have been filled in. You see. Um, uh, th those yellow areas in the back are, are a, a, a membrane that separates, it's a water separation and moisture separation, and then uh, there's rebar on top of it, and that area then um, was set for pouring. Uh, 
This actually, believe it or not, is the first piece uh, that they had installed of the uh, sanitary sewer. That is a manhole. Uh, that would be at street level, and then the rest of that goes down from there. Um, here again, you can see much more progress um, with those walls all the way up to the roof deck. If you look up here, you can see that. And uh, that's again at the north end. These kind of got out of order for some reason. There is your south end, which has now been poured and is curing. And that's more or less the progress that's made. At this point, you have the north end. Most of the areas that are walls are complete. And there are areas that are, that are walls that are going to be uh, not masonry walls. And those are now uh, with, with, the, with the studs all in place. And that's moving along. And they're going to start basically filling that in. And you're going to start to see things that look more like classrooms. Uh, and then what will happen after that is they will, they will bring them online eventually so that they'll be uh, more or less finished uh, in the early part of the summer at, before the, right around the end of school. So it, it, it's at least some of the ones in the north end. The south end is now poured. They're marking out the areas on the floors for walls and they'll start with the masonry walls uh, down there at that end of the building. And uh, we expect steel next month the end of next month so we can start building the buildings that are going on outside and so that's that's more or less where the progress is on it michelle it's amazing and and to see how much work is has been done i'm, I'm just curious i've only been really up here when construction's not happening has there been i mean there must be a lot of workers here has there been sound i mean i remember in the beginning we were kind of losing power or whatever but we fixed that but i haven't heard anything is it no we've not we've on? not had any issue we've had well-behaved workers workers who have been instructed not to speak with students or passers-by or things like that they're kind of like in their own world and they just go about their job and they work and uh, yeah, there's there's a bit of noise if you're in the construction, indoor in the interior construction, but you don't hear it outside of that. That's amazing. That's great. So it's it's been done been done quite well. Great, um, thank you. And uh, there, and there, I'm, uh, we're really looking. You're, you're really going to. Unfortunately, you don't see the progress unless you go through these areas. And um, anyone who should you want to go through those areas, you better be prepared to come here with some pretty stout boots and we'll have hard hats for you. But uh, there isn't a lot to see other than what you've seen in the pictures of this. I've seen the concrete mixer things out by the, pool, what was the pool entrance? How are they getting all that up to the science? Oh, well, what happens is the, the, concre the, the, the concrete truck, the, the cement mixer, mm -hmm. drives down the far end and enters through what used to be the handicapped spaces and they pull up relatively close to the building and then that that concrete gets offloaded into another device which then puts it into a hose about yay big around uh, and they, they stand there and pour the concrete. They poured the south end of the building. That floor started at 8 in the morning and it was done by, by like 9.30, quarter to 10. Two and a half hours they oh completed gosh. the pour of the entire south that area and it was a little bit longer for the north area but that's how fast it goes down and then once it's poured there they've screened it and they've got it all ready and it's more or less done um, and then they put plastic on top of it and keep wetting it down in order to make it cure properly um, and that's and that's what you've got in there and it's, uh, it's it's really an amazing it's an amazing thing how fast it goes the other thing i'll bring you next time is the one picture i couldn't get into the show but as we were in the south area of the building, I looked up at a beam going across, and on that beam is painted a vintage 1970 peace symbol. Someone <laughs> painted it on the beam in the building. We don't know who or how, oh, but I'll get you a picture of that. I have it on my, on my phone. It's, it's really kind of cool. So you never know what you find when you open the walls. Well, and speaking of opening the walls and putting, um, ONG has said, when the first beam goes across, they're going to invite we're going to invite people to sign it, including oh, you great. all, including our seniors, including <coughs> to say that uh, maybe it will be somebody else's time capsule long. <laughs> Very cool. Greg, one question: Are we are you on schedule? We are on schedule. We have uh, we are hoping to pick up some time. One of the things that's really been a boon to us has been the weather. Uh, January was cold, and that cold weather makes it difficult because they, they, had, they had to bring one of the pieces of equipment, a diesel uh, excavator, into the building 
Because otherwise, outside, left outside, they couldn't start it. It was that cold that the diesel fuel was viscous and they couldn't make it run through the engine. It would start, but then it would die. So they had to bring it into the building. So January was brutal. But part of January, all of December, all of February has been just like, go, go ahead. I mean, it's been wonderful so far. We still need to get through March. <laughs> I know. We have, to, we, have to get, we have to get through March. But they don't care about snow. What they care about is temperature and right. rain. Right. They would rather have five, or five feet of snow than uh, five inches of rain. You know, so because uh, the, they can take the snow and move it off with earth moves, but it's out of the way. Right. So that that's what we're you know we're hoping to keep that schedule. The other thing is because they're 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 making each person that's employed on the job each each crew has got to indicate where they are at various times. They're able to move things up in the schedule that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do. And so we're hoping to pick up a few weeks in the schedule as we go through that will either get us done sooner or will compensate for something else that slows us down. Uh, and that's sort of um, you know, more or less where we, where we are. And we have caught a few breaks. You know, they excavated a tank, which at the end of the uh, auto, what used to be the auto shop area, that we didn't know what that tank was used to store. Don was pretty confident since he tested it a while ago there was anything there. And it turned out to have absolutely no environmental problems at all. So sometimes you, uh, you know, you, know, you catch a break, and we've caught a few. Um, the one thing we've changed, I mean, we have made, we, we did have to make a change in the in what we were building, and that had to do with the with the sugar shack. That just became a real problem for us. Uh, the cost of it was just ballooning out of control, and we decided, uh, even though we had put down a deposit that we're going to lose half of, so we're going to lose about twenty five, not short of twenty five hundred dollars. It was better than spending the other thirty thousand dollars that it was required to get it done, and it's not part. Of, it's not required for the program that it's in. It's just an extra added thing. So we may revisit that sometime in the future. But at this point in time, that's one thing we've pulled out because it just made no sense, and it was not in the location that was particularly helpful uh, to us. And uh, so we're trying to keep that budget tight, and we're trying to stay ahead. Right now, we are slowly but surely. Actually, not slowly. We are quickly losing the owner's contingency. We're down to about $108,000 on the owner's contingency, in part because of the $280,000 uh, riding ring uh, that you wanted us to do. And so we, we've, now, we've now pulled that out. So that's brought our contingency down to that. And hopefully, we won't find any, any things that cause us to show up. Yeah, I'm just briefly wondering what made the sugar shack all of a sudden so expensive. Were you trying to get electricity to it or something? It well, the way the, the way it was designed, it was the, it was designed and it was the, the plans and the specs. It was specked out in such a manner that it brought electricity to the site, but it didn't distribute it within the sugar shack. So that had to be done. It brought it brought water to the site, but water it's not a heated building, so you can't bring the water into the building. So you have to have some way to get it from a hydrant outside into the building for when you need it to clean off the. Uh, you know, at the end of the season, you've got to clean up all the equipment. Um, in addition, there was a limit. There was really no way to get water out of the building because it wasn't designed to have, because it wasn't designed to have water in the building. No one thought to design it to have uh, any connection to the uh, the, 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 se the sewage, uh, the septic system. And as a result, all of those add-ons, when you add all those things in there, and then you added the $5,800 worth of equipment that had to be purchased for it, what we're going to do is we are going to find a way to make sugaring part of the curriculum, but it's going to be done on a more demonstration basis with a smaller unit inside the kitchen, um, you know, under a range hood that's capable of removing the, the, you know, the, the vapor, the water vapor, so we don't end up with the walls sweating in the kitchen. So we're going to we're going to try that as opposed to this because it was this thing was supposed to be a a ten thousand dollar thing and it's and it literally tripled in, in the magnitude of it got crazy and we said look we're going to put money into this thing and what we don't want to do is have ourselves in the position where we have to go out of pocket or we have to take out something that really is necessary and so this just didn't seem like the way to go so that was a, a, a decision that we made uh, with the recommendation of the superintendent on the curriculum side of it. Uh, and so I think that's that's more or less um, where we are on that. I'm just wondering um, the the generous gift from the people's family, um, that million dollar gift. Where we stand on that? I mean, 
at some point, I'm sure you have to kind of work with the building committee about what we're doing with that, or is that something you're still going to wait for the future on? It's, it, it's, it's on hold right now. It's something we'll discuss in the future. Yeah. So right now, we're we're only working with what are our grants and what is our funding and to develop our programs. Okay. And I'm just wondering, like, when he brings up something like the sugar shack, might that be something that we would consider for the future? Are you kind of working on? Well, what we're doing right now is because especially with the ff &E, only thing we're looking at what is core to our actual program um so when we're making these decisions it's really it, it, it's an enhancement but it's not core to the curriculum it's not something that we can't do otherwise we also look at what are potential field trips and you know the cost to benefit ratio when we're taking a look at what we need in order to have a high functioning and again when we're talking about stem and we're talking about evolving and, and making a higher level our decisions are being made right now. So we've uh, taken that conversation with additional funding and put it off to the side and we're just looking at our decisions right now. Yeah, and one, one of the issues with the Sugar Shack operation is, is that there's, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to teach people how to run that kind of operation? Uh, do you need it to be at, a, at something greater than a demonstration scale? Does it need to be at a production scale? Sure. Um, here, we're not going mm -hmm. to likely be able to, because of the way this is a school and there's the ability, the necessity of having the ability of emergency vehicles to get around the building, it was not likely that we were going to have this sugar shack connected by, by plastic tubing to maple sugar, to maple syrup, you know, maple trees, uh, sugar maple trees. Um, and therefore, you weren't going to be able to have the whole operation unless you stuck the sugar shack off in the woods somewhere. It was going to be difficult to have it function on a, anything that approached a real situation. So you were going to import the, the you know, you were going to import the sap, and then you were going to run it. So the question is, do you do it as a demonstration with a little bit less intensity, or do you spend thirty or thirty-five thousand dollars on a building for something that's not really going to run? At a, and, and I guarantee you, there are a lot of sugar shacks in Vermont that don't have plumbing, and don't have electricity running through, them, and are using wood, not um, gas or whatever, to, to, to run them, and are probably operating at a really high level, but probably haven't invested you know, quite as much as, as we were investing on a, you know, on, on a, on a scale uh, in order to, you know, to get there. So this was kind of a, an extra, almost an extravagant thing that we might, you know, again, if the opportunity, it turns out to be something we really miss, and we have a way to do it that gives a really good way to do it, we'll, we'll look at it. But right now, we've, we've sort of pulled that out. So that, that's more or less what your, your building committee is up to. And if anyone else has any questions, I'd be happy to address it. There is one item on the action items tonight um, which is going to be very simple. It's a lot simpler than it looks, so I'll, I'll address that at that point. Thank you, Nicole. Hey, Megan and Greg both covered what I'll speak about briefly, so off quickly so we can get on to other topics. Um, we are, with the most recent approved payment application number seven that the building committee approved on the 18th, we have spent $5.7 million toward the project cost. Um, Megan and I did make progress in submitting our first payment through the CT portal for reimbursement. We submitted only with respect to the agri-science portion of the grant because the science lab has not been opened to us yet by the state, but they are working on that and promised to have it done in short order. Um, our first payment request is for $3.2 million, and if it's approved, we should see it mid-March. Um, we have our $9 million ban coming due April 10th, and I've been working with the Finance Committee to have a closing of our permanent bond financing and temporary ban on that same day, and we'll speak more to that when we get to the action items. Um, that's all I have. Sure. So, I, um, when you say you submitted 3.2 million, is that 3.2 million of receipts and then we're expecting 80% back on that? Or yes. is, okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so going to item seven, first, uh, first action to consider 
And if appropriate, a motion to approve the senior plus trip to New York City on April 26th to 28th of this year. And we approve the senior class trip to New York City on April 26th to 28th. Second. Uh, second. Any <laughs> kind of discussion? <laughs> this is their senior class trip. This is their for fun. Yeah. They go over the weekend. Oh, it's massive. Yes. 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 Friday oh. to a Sunday. Yes. Okay. Fun. Okay. 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 All right, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, the motion passes unanimously. Mm -hmm. Item uh, 7B, to consider and if appropriate, a motion to authorize the Secretary of the Board to sign the signature form to authorize Nicole, Director of Finance, to sign claims for reimbursement to the agreements for the child nutrition programs. I have a motion. So moved. Second. All right, motion has been seconded. Are there any questions? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion passes unanimously. 7C, to consider if appropriate a motion to approve the bond demand financing structure recommended by the Finance Committee at the February 20, 20th, uh, 2019 meeting. I'll give the floor to you, Nicole. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, our $9 million ban is coming due April 10th. Um, the intention was always to issue permanent bond financing for our portion of the program. Um, in looking at um, several different scenarios, and I have to thank the Finance Committee because it had a lot of meetings <laughs> to go over all of our options um, so that we could make sure that we find the best option for the district. We have um, Bob Beeson, my predecessor, had made several payments from the general fund toward the project, which um, put us in a position where we don't need to bond the full nine million. After having discussions with Charles Heaven, our auditor, and Doug Gillette, who is our bond counsel at Dave Pitney, we are recommending that we bond 8.25 million, and at the same time take a bond anticipation of four million, the $4 million will bridge the gap for when we are, have to wait for a holdback of the state funds at the end of the project. Going to issuance of both of them at the same time saves us issuance fees, considerable issuance fees. And if you look at the existing and proposed debt analysis, which was part of the packet, when, if we were to go with this scenario, the increase in our debt service in year one in addition would be $63,000, but the bond premium that's expected to be paid back to us at the issuance will cover that sum, so there won't be any upward increase on debt service for the district for the year. In addition, it should be high enough, and we won't know until we get the exact pricing, to cover a few additional years of debt service until we get back to where we are now because what Bob had worked very hard was to keep us level funded with respect to our debt service, which would happen in year six. So to give you an example of what we can expect our bond premium to be, the town of Cheshire just issued a 14.5 million bond last week. Their bond premium was $932,000. Ours will likely not be as significant as that, um, but it is a large sum of money that will be coming back to us as a premium, which will help offset some of the debt service that we're looking at as we move forward. This bond repayment amortization is for 21 years, and we did that to smooth some of the principal in the beginning so that we could keep our debt service level funded in our operating budget. And it's priced at 3.25%, again, Town of Cheshire having been the most recent to go out, they just went out a week ago. They do have a AAA rating from Moody's, but their rate on their 14.5% came in at 2.71. So we, that 3.25% that Barry is projecting is a conservative number. We expect to get a better rate. What about on the bands? The bands, he can't, well, the, the band for 2021 and 2022, he can't project at this time. Mm -hmm. But the band he does expect to come in at between 1.8 and 2%. We receive a premium on that as well on the band sale. So I know we had the model where we thought around 2%, but our net interest cost, or what, what is it called? Uh, 
it is a net interest cost is what we get like uh, when you add it together we should get lower rates I think that that's what brings it down to like a 1.8 or something like that but I mean he described to us that those I mean we're at historically favorable rates we know that they're just getting higher to go on so the sooner we should get the better the other thing that is going to factor into this is we don't yet have our bond rating, and I have a call on March 8th um, with Barry and Moody's. Um, I, it's an hour-long call. It's a process where they ask um, several questions about the district, and that's the point at which they will issue our final rating. So that will affect our interest rate. But he has it priced as it were 2A, which he believes is what we will need. Sorry. <laughs> Question, even though I was like there for um, I, we're not able to get a triple A bond rating because we're not, um, we're well, like tax, tax exempt, right? We don't have the ability to tax. So, so Cheshire can't, can, <coughs> we can't, so that's how they got a triple A bond rating? Right, because the town of Cheshire had the ability to tax. Okay, because yeah, I was under the impression that we were just about as high as we could get with that yeah. assumption of the double A bond rating. Okay. Actually, we have a lot of advantages as a region over a, over a municipal school system, but that's not one of them. That's a disadvantage that we suffer, is that we have no tax authority. We're dependent on the towns to actually tax. Are there any questions? So when do you think you'd actually go to bond at this point, if we approve tonight? It will close on April 10th. It will be sent to investors. It's going to be a full public sale. He's not doing a negotiated sale, which means it will be open for anybody, which takes a little bit longer. And it will go out three by three fifteen. It will be go out. It will go out to investors. And it will close on April tenth. And from a cash flow standpoint, considering you know the, the timing of the state reimbursement and everything, looks like we're going to be okay. It looks like we're going to be okay. Good. And the money that we spent already out of existing operating funds, um, still subject to reimbursement, right? Subject to reimbursement by the state, but right. we cannot reimburse ourselves by bond proceeds because that affects the tax exempt status of the investor. So it's reimbursable by the state. All right. Any other questions? All right. Uh, any motion? Yeah, I'll. Uh, I will move to. Let's see what you're looking. Uh, I will move uh, to approve the bond and ban financing structure as recommended by the Finance Committee at the February 20, 2019 meeting. Second. A friendly, okay. Uh, as a friendly amendment, as as um, a, attached or included in, in, in the board packet? Yes. Yes. Accepted. Accepted. Okay. And, and I just wanted to comment. I, I think this really is well laid out, well thought out. I, uh, I'm very I think this is good. And the idea that our, our bond, uh, the amount of money that we need for debt, you know, for debt service and whatnot, it does not increase over what it is now as, as well as, you know, I think, helpful. And, and I also presume that should, for example, the economy of this thing go even better, if we should get ahead of ourselves in terms of funds coming in, uh, either because we take in more, more students or we have some other benefit that I would assume that gives us the ability to either make programmatic things that otherwise would cost money or to retire the bonds sooner? Uh, I don't think, I, I don't think, I don't think we can retire the, the bonds sooner. But Nicole, you can confirm that. We, we can't retire the bonds sooner. We can't? And, and we don't have a date after which they're, it, it's 21 years. They have to stay in for 21 years. But they should say this, we, we, we could probably pay the bond off, but we still have to pay the same interest. You know, you're not getting a break for an early payment. No, I guess you're not. So we so can pay the bands off early. The or bands we possibly off. Yes. not take the second year band, depending on how time it was construction and hold backwards. Right. So but still if, uh, if the program is is economically uh, uh, providing the district back a surplus, I'm sure we'll uh, well then, we'll then what it does is it reduces the amount of money that we need to tap to have taxed by the towns Correct. in order to operate the school system. So there is the ability to, to lower the cost if it it does come in. But, you know, if things continue in a very good direction, it it falls apart. Okay, so the motion's on the floor has been seconded, and, uh, and if there's no further discussion, uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand for this one. Raise your hand. Okay, 
All those opposed? Please. All those opposed? <laughs> All right. The motion passes unanimously. Good luck. Get it done before the interest rates rise. All right, item uh, 7D, to consider if appropriate a motion to approve the transportation contract with All-Star Transportation from July 1, 2019 to June 30th, 2024. A motion, please. So moved. Second. All right. As you approve the Well, is there a particular reason we want to go out five years? Um, you have to wonder. Is leasing the owning the buses? No, I don't think it does. Cole, did you? Uh, this was the uh, contract that was negotiated. Bob Keeson had had put it together, so I'm struggling to provide you with an answer. Um, but I can tell you that it was mapped out. Nicole, do you have anything? You yeah, I actually can say a question to say that the proposed contract was presented at a finance committee meeting that I attended before I actually started working with the district. And my immediate thought was the same, why would we go out for a five-year contract? Um, and fortuitously, just this afternoon, um, CASBO circulated the results of a survey they took of different districts who were negotiating uh, transportation contracts, what the terms were in terms of the longevity and also the percentage increases um, and I was happy to see this this afternoon because nearly every district did a five-year renewal. Some did six, um, and their rates, their increases ranged between two and a half and three point four percent per year, which actually we're, we are right in the same place. And there were twelve <coughs> districts that responded to this survey. One of them was Region Eight, um, as well as Brookfield. So. There are districts in our area that are realizing the same um, renewal terms that we are, if not um, ours. One of the things we also looked at, Superintendent Bennett had gotten um, the terms of another district. And we were initially taken back because their annual percentage increases were a little bit less than what we got. But when we looked closer, our initial rates were much lower. So even though our percentages increases were higher, we still were lower. Um, in terms of pricing overall. So, so I would imagine that the five-year look on these is that people anticipate rates are going to go up faster <laughs> otherwise, and therefore they're trying to lock in a period of, of relative stability. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the reason why we're doing five years. And we'd be a good company. Um, OK, thank you. So what's the percentage increase then, contract to contract? For our contract? Different buses increase at um, different rates, um, but I'm going to do the Type 1 bus because that's the bulk of our transportation. Okay. So our Type 1 buses from year to year, in the initial year, it's a 3.23% increase. The second year of the contract, it's 3.12. The third year of the contract, it's a 1.52 increase. The fourth year, it's 2.99. And the fifth year, it's 2.9. Cool. Are these, um, I, I've read some districts, like I think the Milford is switching to natural gas buses. These are not natural these gas are, buses. So these are still diesel. Is there anything else terms wise with the contract we should be aware of? Um, all of the other terms <coughs> of the contract have been remain the same. I am working with the bus company to make sure all of our new policy language gets into the contract because it wasn't in the prior contract. Um, and then in years past, we have had to purchase the first 42,000 gallons of diesel, and it stays the same each year of this contract. Okay. <coughs> um, who signs this contract? Who's it's based on the dollar amount? Who's, 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 who needs to sign it? You know that it is the SB board. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. 
Well, I mean, if the board the board's approving a contract, we uh, I don't think we've seen. So we can approve the terms, subject, and provide the chair with the authority to uh, to go ahead and sign it if all things look fine. Or does the board want the the contract to come back for uh, for a final review? Well, we could approve, um, well, actually, we, really we don't know what we're talking about, do we? So, I was going to say we could approve it if you are willing to sign it once you see it. Yes. So, I think that kind of makes us a good time. Great. You know, wearing my lawyer hat, I would be delighted to fly spec any contract you bring in front of us, but the question is whether there's any value added. I'm not sure I can provide any value add, and I don't know if anyone else can. If anyone is familiar with transportation contracts or that kind of thing, I would hope that we have legal counsel look at this at some point, and then um, you know I'd be happy to let you know you work with the superintendent and our <coughs> counsel if necessary uh, to make sure that the final contract works. Michelle. Yeah, I was going to say that um, you know if we agree to the the terms that's the big thing and Nicole mentioned the policy updates that need to go in and can we go ahead and approve conditionally as long as there are no substantial other changes from the previous contract I well, mean if, I, think if that's what you, I think that's what you'd be happy you would have to vest in the chair right, that the conditions set forth by the board the conditions of approval uh, that those conditions are uh, uh, have to be met prior to executing the agreement and then, um, and then any other sort of normal due diligence, uh, did we check this box that we reviewed with that person, that I would work with uh, the administration to make sure all those so, things get to the so, side. But, so we, we could make it that it would only have to come back to the board if there was material change from the pre previous contract. Yeah. Uh, yes. Exactly. Yeah. You do this sometimes in the board say, like, I could make a motion to authorize the board chair to sign the transportation contract with All Star Transportation. Um, Contingent upon his agreement. Okay. Could I just add a front of the All Star contract as presented to the board? <coughs> well, or, or as the well, terms. terms. Yeah. All right. The terms, terms. were. The terms of which. Yeah. So yes, so Alan's wish. So Alan's amendment is actually to put the motion on for Jen. Did you? Yeah, and so has, yeah. Thank you. So right. so moved. So do you accept Alan's amendment to your uh, to the motion? Uh, sure. Okay. I was the second. I think. And you were the second, so you, you were. Are you still okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? Uh, John. I don't need to sell it any further, but um, there wasn't a whole lot of competition out there. Maybe one company started <coughs> trying to cap the building. And um, some of the features <coughs> are many of the vehicles are going to be brand new, and the camera system is correct. So there's value in that. Yeah, the zone feature. Not the one. Zone oh, feature. Oh, okay. Thank you, John. All right. Uh, any further comments, discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, I just a quick question. Yes. Um, the districts that are going to be sending us students for the uh, agri science mm -hmm. project, they're responsible that, for that is their own transportation. Correct. So that correct. would be covered under our office. Okay. <coughs> Moving right along to item 7E, to consider and if appropriate, increase the prior authorization to the building committee to expend an additional $6,750 for the outdoor riding rate. Greg, I'll give you the floor. Yeah, um, if you recall, the board had approved $280,000 for the outdoor riding rate. That was actually the bid of uh, H.I. Stone uh, Company uh, to do that work. Um, and what we did not add to that, that was net of the, there are three fees that are attached onto every bid in the project. 
One of them is a 1.25% construction manager's fee. That's $3,500. Uh, the general liability insurance is 0.55%. That's $1,559. And the performance bond is 0.60%. That's um, $1,701. So that totals uh, $6,760 added to the $286,760. And that's what we need in order to execute that. So. Uh, I wanted to expand the amount of authority to spend uh, so that we don't uh, have to take that from somewhere else in our budget to cover those, those normal costs of a contract. But just a quick question, Greg. Is this a complement to an already existing indoor? Arrival? Yes. We, we originally had the indoor one. Uh, we, had, we had put the, the outdoor one on a list of adults we got a bid from H.I. Stone, and then we, just, we, we were reluctant to authorize it to go forward, uh, and we were thinking of bringing it in as a change order later in the project, and the board made it clear they wanted that outdoor ramp. And so we put it in, and now we're executing. It will be built. It will be, the work will be done. It will be constructed. It will be part of the project once the building goes. So, so Greg, do you put the motion on the board? Um, yeah, I'd be happy to move that the, the board uh, uh, increase the prior authorization uh, to the building committee uh, for an additional $6,750 for the outdoor riding ring. Second. Okay. Yeah. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. The motion passes unanimously. Yeah. Building committee thanks you. you made all right. Next item on the agenda is the second reading of policy 5141.21 administering the medication, Michelle. Yeah, so you'll find the policy in your packet. This was a policy that we approved previously. Um, actually, Nicole sort of alluded to this. This is um, we're with the state required um, additional language for um, school, but for the ability of people to carry EpiPens on school buses. Um, what I wanted to point out, what's different, I'm just trying to find it. It's the blue, carrier. yes, it's the carrier part. Greg was concerned that a comma changed the meaning and after a little short bit of debate, we decided it was just easier to take the exact language from the state statute and put it into the policy so that we wouldn't have to debate the meaning. So the blue language is what state statute says it has to be. At CAVE, it just abbreviated it for some reason, and we figured it was easier to just take their language. Right. Doesn't solve the problem. <laughs> See, the, 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 what the state has done, what the statute is, they're thinking of local or regional school districts that run, that own their school buses and hire drivers and run their own project and run their own transportation. And that's not what we do. We hire a carrier to do this for us. So I, I really think that this is not, that this language doesn't, doesn't work for us. I think it's, it's describing just, a carrier. Well, what it says is a carrier means any local or regional school district. So we are a carrier. Or B, any person, firm, or corporation engaged in the business of transporting. Right. That's who we hire. No, that's not what it says. It yeah. says any local or regional school district, comma, any educational institution providing elementary or secondary education or any person, firm, or corporation under contract to such district engage. I, I just, um, I, I think I think the problem is is that it, it is, it's too inclusive, and I don't think it's necessary because we're not the one who's the carrier. It should really be the per, the firm, person, firm, or corporation under contract with the district, with, with regional school district twelve engaged in the business of doing this. I think that's all it needs to say, and I think the rest of this is just it's a statute that just it can't really did it to service. They really did a disservice here. They did a lousy job. Mm -hmm. Let the recorder pick that up so Cabe understands 
that this just parroting the state language is not very smart. It really should say, if you're a regional school district and you hire someone, here's what you say. Greg, the blue language is not CAVE. The blue language is state statute. I think, you're, I think your beef is with, with the legislature. No, the, the, le the legislature is giving you the whole panoply of things. You don't need to adopt it. If the legislature says that the carrier could be any one of the following five people, if you've got person five, you don't need one through four. Well, all I'm telling you is, we don't need this whole thing about it. We don't need to define carrier to mean us, because otherwise we're taking on the duties of a carrier. And if you look at the carrier has duties under this thing, and we're not going to be doing them. For example, we're not going to be um, uh, educating the, the, the members of the, the people who work for them on, on what their obligations are, where it says under school bus driver training, it, it says that the, um, Beginning July 1, 2019, each carrier must provide training to school bus drivers. I don't want that obligation. We're not doing that. We don't have it. We do. It's an or. John, I just have a, and I say this with respect, Greg, but, and I say this sincerely. I think, and I know that you're already doing the building committee, so I know your plate's really full. But I almost think it would be great if Greg was on policy because I think that a lot of his questions, because this is his nature, understandably so, because he's an attorney, to be able to go through the policies. And that way you can kind of flush things out prior to here. Because if you, and I have to be honest, sometimes I tune it out because I just do. But if they're valid and there's something that you really want to address, maybe talking about it out of policy meeting and then bringing it to the table kind of flushed out might be something worth considering. Just an option. That's a great, that's a great suggestion. How do you feel about that, Greg? You're very welcome. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> and I just am saying Absolutely. that because you, Any you, and you tend to read time. things there's an opening, right? in between I, the I, lines. I, and if it's something <laughs> truly that is something worth looking at, it might be worth the time to do it. So yeah, no, I, pre I appreciate that. I don't know where I will find the hours to serve on that committee. I'm just throwing so, it out there. So how, how are we going to move right. this Here's forward? Yeah, just move it. Yeah. Well, I could make a, I could propose an amendment and you could vote it up or down. Well, let me just say one thing before we turn it. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's covered in here. Um, different responsibilities for people other than bus companies. Um, and this is just a de definition of some of them. This is administrative medication from a whole, you know, nurses, mm, no. staff, blah, blah, before and after school programs, and all this stuff. So it's not like the whole policy has to do with just uh, bus companies. So we're really dealing with this, this definition. And the definition is talking about how it's A or B. They didn't lump it all into A. So you, could, you should feel some sense of security in the, the fact that the carrier may be A or B, not that it's just Carrier means blah, 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 and we're one of those. And there's nothing distinguishing between the two. With that said, what do you think? I'd like to make a motion. <laughs> Except for, uh, as a second reading, policy number 5141 point 21, administering medication. Second. All right. Been seconded. Any further discussion, Greg? I, I just would, if if we're not going to fix what I believe to be a bad language that 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 makes it difficult, and the only way we'll ever find out if we're right or wrong is when something happens and some parent decides to sue us for failing to discharge our carrier liability, our carrier obligations, when we're not in fact a carrier, and they use the policy as Exhibit A. So if we want to take that risk that we're going to get sued for something because we're a carrier, okay, but we ought to at least put something in here that says, in this definition of carrier, where it says any local or regional school district, comma, any educational institution providing, et cetera, comma, firm or corporation under contract, <laughs> if we could somehow have something in there that said as applicable or something, I, I don't know, it just, it, 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 I think the language is designed by the state to give you the full panoply of what's <coughs> available because different districts operate different ways. And what we're doing is slavishly copying it. 
And sometimes when you do that, you interpret yourself into a regime you'd rather not be in later. So I think it ought to say as appropriate or something, even if we can't just eliminate the first line and a half. Just my views. I serve on the committee with Michelle, and we've gone over this three times, and I know you're saying this, Greg, I just don't see it. And I know I'm not a lawyer, but I mean, we've talked about this for so long now, and I just don't see where the discrepancy is or where, where we would get in trouble, but. Fine. Okay. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Nay. All right, so we have two, two opposed, but the motion still passes on the second reading, so the policy has been adopted. Okay. Michelle, we still have the floor. All right. Um, this is for first reading uh, policy 6142. Point 101, student nutrition and physical activity. Um, this policy um, has actually kind of popped up a couple of times. It's got a long history and I won't go through all of it, but it, um, it was in the wellness committee of the district, which is made up of um, Mr. Conway, the head of our PE department, our head nurse at the time that has since changed, but and some other committee members that are part of the wellness policy, and they, they had it for a while, and then it came back to us, and then the revisions didn't quite get to us. So anyway, it appeared on our agenda several months ago. Here it is back again. Um, what you'll find in your packet are two versions our current policy and the proposed new policy. The reason it is not uh, lined through is because uh, it is so significantly different. Having said that, I read through both of them, and even though... This is this was that one's favorite one. Yeah. About the cookies. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, and I need to point that, I need to point something about, out about that. So if you look at our current policy, 6142.101, it is the one that has numbers down the left side. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Number three was the um, celebrations uh, portion, and it is actually not in the policy that is being proposed, and that was um, an oversight on the committee's uh, Part, because it was not part of the CAVE policy that the wellness committee of the district was looking at, they did not actually then take what they had proposed and compare it back to what we had, what we had done. However, the policy committee had included that because of parents coming to us uh, with concerns uh, over students with allergies and uh, parents who were trying to have a handle on what their children were eating for nutrition purposes, not just for health reasons, not just allergies. So, um, but since it, since it, so had it come through the committee before it came here, um, the committee would have put it back in. And so, but it's, it's here for the, for the board to choose whether to put that piece back in to what the um, policy, the wellness committee is proposing. If you look at the new policy, um, they dealt with a lot of language that is ne is, st is required by state statute, um, looking at nutrition guidelines and using my plate or whatever dietary guidelines are um, endorsed by the health department. Um, there, there's a lot of language in here that was required by law to um, improve offerings uh, in the schools for um, food offerings, but also talk some about physical activity. Um, there's a, a new sec uh, point here. It says schools will work toward providing 60 minutes of physical acti activity for students as a best practice. 
that is mentioned in the state statute but is not required so it is why it is worded that way that we will work towards that um, uh, some other provisions about marketing um, and and beverages being brought in so so it was a lot of language that is required by state statute that they dealt with when they were going through this policy so uh, did that did that make sense yeah yeah. <laughs> I know you've heard a lot about it. Greg. I, I don't get paragraph three on celebrations. If the intent here is to encourage healthy lifestyle and healthy things, so what happens? We, 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 you know, they, they fast while it's celebrations in school, and then they go out into life, and in life, every celebration revolves. It doesn't just include food. It revolves around a meal. Most of the celebrations, they will attend office parties. Come on. Uh, I mean, yeah. what, what, what's going to happen is they're going to go out in life, and they're going to be faced with this hard <coughs> smorgasbord that they've never seen before, and they'll have no clue because the only thing they know is the age and abstinence. Right. Yeah. I, think, I really <laughs> think this is... I really think this is over the top and it's crazy, and I move that we delete number three. That's, that's the whole point of this. I know. Um, they add it. Oh, oh, oh. Michelle, that's not in the new one. It's actually not in the new one, but, but I would like, oh, wait, I'm which proposing the, that we put it in. Which is the new one? The new one doesn't have the numbers. The new one's just first rear. I didn't know which one was new. Yeah, the, the new one is just first reading, the other in, one is dated. <laughs> we definitely don't want to put it in. I'm opposed to putting it in. I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong one. My, my fault. Yeah, we heard, we heard from a lot of families. They have um, sports teams and they have pizza parties and they have families and they have. That's different. Yeah, they have plenty of opportunity. They have plenty of opportunity to learn the ways of humankind when it comes to eating and celebrating. So we'll not be cast out of the world. Lisa, um, okay, so I make a motion forward. that we adopt the first reading of uh, policy 6142.101, student nutrition and physical activity school wellness policy, and include number three. Second. Oh, and include it. Oh, and include. Yeah. Oh, second. Oops. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? Including. I'm just wondering, do you need to say where number three is coming from? Well, from the uh, yes. it's from, yeah, what do I say for that? Um, number three in our, the the previous, in our previous policy. Which is 6142.101. It's the same policy. Oh, it's the same policy. Also yeah, oh, this is a replacement. The language, we also have to strike the language about providing food. Well, which, where? No, because I thought I read from. Um, one that says non-sold foods and beverages? Yes, thank you. Yep. Oh um, yeah, I wrote 10. Non-sold food, non -sold food brought into school by students and other persons for such events as birthdays and classroom celebrations shall comply with federal nutrition standards. So you might want to yank that one out there since we're not doing that. Um, the one thing though, and if you it, and we talked about this in number three, it's the last sentence. Some curricular or event-based exceptions may receive administrative approval because they didn't want to strike um, cultural, you know, food around the world day right, right, right. and some other things. So there may be times where food is but it brought does in. Does say events as birthdays and classroom celebrations, so you have to. So we should probably strike place. birthdays, but classroom yeah. celebrations. For for example, we. we um, you know, the ice cream socials that happen. Right. You can get administrative approval for that. There can be exceptions. This is just to... I know uh, Booth had the, like the... Um, I the pie eating. We have the pie, pie feast. We also have the um, chuck wagon. Mm -hmm. So the elementary schools, I mean, there are more that are beyond the classroom. Yeah, but we're not we're only talking about I thought this, I, I read this as specifically celebrations <coughs> within the classroom. Right, exactly. Right, right. right. but then are. Beyond the classroom, we don't have to worry about it. Right. Yeah. These are brought into the school, and, and which we've said it before is allowed by administrative um, All right, so approval. brought into the schools by students and other persons shall comply. Let's just take out the for such events. So 
Okay. Okay. And it's, it's, you know, Shell is a pretty high legal standard. And then to then follow it up that says, but only kidding because it's a recommendation yeah. of the requirement. Right. You ought to just take out Shell and say should. Oh, no, 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 no. I think that parentheses is for us. That's one of those things that needs to be removed because Kate's recommending that to us. Yeah, but if we don't want, if we're I think giving that's ourselves actually our an exception. Committee. Yeah, I think it's yeah. a contradiction to say you yeah, obviously yeah. shall, we'll strike but, the but, the hair, but, you, but we have the authority to override ourselves. Yeah, I would strike we the should. Yeah. I would too, but I, I actually think it should be should. Yeah, I think. Instead right. of shall. Has it's anybody like, noticed that we're about to build a kitchen in the school where students are going to be having food in the classroom? I mean, I don't know how to say this, but I think we've gone over the top here. And I think we ought to remove number three. We have not to enact number three. We should change shall to should and strike the parenthetical. I mean, we really should. We really got to have a degree of flexibility in this, or we're going to bury ourselves. Don't, please, do I? So I really need to bang the gavel and ask for everyone to have one conversation, one one person have the floor. Please. Thank you. Michelle. Um, the number three, um, the first the first sentence is, especially at the elementary level. This was really important to a lot of parents who are fighting health issues and allergies. Um, and they would like control over what their children eat. And there were some classrooms that were particularly um, difficult and there were, there were treats coming in on a weekly basis. The principals asked the board to put this into policy because they were having pushback and having a hard time enforcing this. So I would recommend that we leave it in. It is not going to affect the cooking that happens in agri-science. Okay. That's not what it says. Can I also ask, um, as, a, as a parent with a child with a food allergy, and especially at the elementary school level where, you know, in high school may be different, they know that they can't share foods or they're not tempted by candy or stuff being brought in, I can say that at Booth, the nurse, at any point in time, if there's ever been any event before school, after school, during school, like the spelling bee, I've gotten a phone call to say, you know, we know that your child has food allergies. This is what's present. Would you like me to email you a list of the ingredients? Can, you know, can your child participate or do you want to bring it? I don't know if that's school policy or not. I don't know if that's in here or it's just a really nice thing that she's been doing for me lately. <laughs> but if that's, I, I mean, think that would just an awareness of that food is being brought in, you know, just so you're aware. You know, on those days, I can also have my child wear an allergy bracelet so that way if there's a substitute and not her teacher that knows that situation. It just helps with the very little kids, like you said, like Absolutely. in an elementary school situation where they oh, yeah. I was going to say, I, I, can, I can tell you from experience the way that I've handled this in the past as a building administrator was that any food that was for curricular purpose, um, we gave a list to all of the parents in advance and the parents had to sign off, every parent, regardless if there was an allergy or not that allowed the food to be served. And it was a way that covered, because then at that point, it was not the liability of the school. People were acknowledging the food that was coming in. Well, and I just wanted to add that each administrator might have their own um, sort of internal regulations as to how they administer this. But when, it's com when food's coming in for curricular purposes, everybody knows in advance. This is, this is to make sure that the principals have something to stand on when they say, no, you can't just show up with cupcakes. You can't surprise us like that. It needs to be, and, and they asked for some teeth behind them saying that. And that's why I said curriculum. Yes, because yeah. yeah. one, it's that advanced piece. Like, mm -hmm. if it's curricular, you can't get a sign off if people are just showing up with right. stuff. But, and, and just to go beyond, the, the principals asking for this, it was the school nurses asking for this policy, mm -hmm. and it was parents. I mean, we had, I'll never forget, one of the parents whose child had a, a food allergy, like pleading with us because he said, we need to de-link, you know, uh, birthdays and cupcake celebration because it's just not fair to my son to sit there and have to be segregated from the rest of the class while they're enjoying cupcakes that he couldn't without going into an electric shock. I mean, just. I mean, to try to have a little empathy with those kids that what they're going through. Um, and I think this is, this is a no-brainer. We have to do this as a board. 
Kurt? I agree uh, that, and, and this is limited to celebrations, but if our intent is to, is to, if our problem is at the elementary school, then we should specifically say that will not be, where it says will not, and will not means no way will you. So will, no, where it says no food or candy will be distributed, where it says celebrations will not include food, limit this to the elementary schools. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, when you have the, the, the people in here for a celebration at a board meeting, you can't have the cakes and all the things that you've had. When we have the groundbreaking and we have a celebration, you can't serve those cakes and, and things that they served out there. I think we need to understand if this is an elementary school problem, then let's limit it to the elementary school I, and let's not. I, I want to say, I think there is some in which there is, you know, with every birthday celebration and all those things, we do want to acknowledge the child. However, it is disruptive to instruction. And so I also don't want to open up the can of worms that now when they get into sixth grade and higher, now we'll start having the cupcake celebration. So I don't think it's, li you know, just when they get to. Well, then limit it to in classroom celebrations. Okay, I mean, that, that, that's how you do that. But what you don't want to do is have a situation where somebody comes in here and says, wait a minute, you've got food and it's graduation and it's a celebration. You can't have it. You've got language in here that if I wanted to bring a lawsuit against this district, I would stop the food at graduation. I'd stop the food in here. Right. I'd stop all the celebration food. You don't want to do that. All you need to do is limit it to the elementary school and in classroom celebrations. The last sentence says, some curricular or event-based exceptions may receive administrative approval. The administration approves all of those events. Do they approve all of them? Yes. Graduation, board meetings, yes. with our administrators here, I hope they approve this event. John? All right. John? No, I kind of agree with Greg. It should be all or none. You have to ask yourself, what is the um, frequency of um, celebrations where food is involved and what is the um, frequency of an incident incident where someone has an allergic reaction I mean uh, has there been a severe allergic reaction in recent history it's not just the allergic reactions it's it's health it's parents wanting to know that their children aren't being presented so with sugar I every would say strike the especially and just say at the elementary level and and have no option of uh, providing food under any circumstance because we've gone a hundred and something years with celebrations in the school where food is involved now this is actually this we put this um policy in place in 2014 so it's currently on the books right so we're just so, continuing it. I mean, why not just say no food at any celebration in the elementary level? I have to tell you, I mean, I mean, maybe you could probably back me up. I mean, it's working really well. It's been it's been revised for a number of years now. We're not getting complaints from the principals. We're not getting complaints from teachers. We're not getting complaints from parents. Probably getting complaints from some students because they'd like more sugar. <laughs> that's why. But we're that's parents. about that's about it. I just want to say too that you know we're limiting the, the, is the intention about allergies and healthy foods or we, and it's not about limiting celebrations I hate saying this but there was an example we field, field day every year Washington primary school and all the they have cookouts mm -hmm. they serve hamburgers hot dogs salad and watermelon and watermelon couldn't be served one year because of an allergy that's not a cupcake that's watermelon so, I mean, we could really nitpick this all we want. It's ridiculous. We've been doing this since 2014. No one is complaining. It's in there. Let's keep it. Let's move on. Please. All right. So there's a motion on the floor. It's been seconded. <clears throat> I don't believe it's been amended. Can you just order to No, we did. The motion had the, the amendment. Oh, the motion. Okay. But also I kind of lost track. Language, like an hour ago. <laughs> yeah. The language about the... Uh, right. Yes, right, so I wrote that down. Can, can so we will see it, it back. We will see Great. it back so, in so the, the second reading. So the motion is to approve this first reading with the addition of paragraph C three, three. three, three. three excuse me, three. from from the uh, current policy. Yes. Um, yeah. Correct. 
Yes, yes. Okay, that's the motion on the floor. And straight yes. for the first and language. And the cleaning up of mm -hmm. non-sold foods and yeah. beverages. Right. Yes, right. I, I wrote that down. All right. All in favor? Wait. Aye. 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 Who did a second? I made the motion. Who Aye. seconded it? No one second. Second. I thought Michelle did. Right? I thought she did. I, 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 I might have. I might have. But let's let's be. That's fine. Alan can. Alan. Okay. So. Show. Alan did it. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. All right. One, one opposed. Thank you very much. Sorry, that was a little First messy. Reading. Who wants to celebrate with some chips? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm on a cupcake. <laughs> All right. Moving to the next uh, item on the agenda is getting into the bylaws. Um, all right, the first one up is where we left off last week, uh, or last week, excuse me, last meeting. Um, uh, Board of Education Officers, it's bylaw 9121. Uh, if you read it, you'll see a note at the top, which was that several bylaws are being consolidated into this. Into, uh, into this. So 9120, Prior or the current had election of officers. 9122 was a bylaw regarding the vice chair. 9126 was a bylaw for the treasurer. And what we're suggesting here is collapsing it all into a single uh, bylaw. 9121, which which is a comprehensive <laughs> view of uh, all of it, including the secretary, which was up until this point not covered as an officer of the board. So, um, with that, I'm going to scroll through and uh, just call out what we thought were the uh, probably more salient points to the to the bylaw. Again, everything that's in black with the original language. Everything that's in red is uh, is a net new or change to the existing bylaw. So uh, it talks at first about uh, basically we have an organizational meeting. When that occurs at that organizational meeting, we will elect a new <coughs> slate of officers, and that describes the process that we've currently been running, how that works, and um, and how an officer can be removed uh, from their position with a two-thirds vote. Again, that's existing. That's existing language. So we get into the uh, officers themselves, um, starting with the chair, uh, and it's a uh, call out of the chair's responsibilities. Again, so there's some tightening as we were going along, uh, or completing thoughts, uh, for example, uh, the first one. Um, but we did add, for example, there that a, a special meeting can be called upon written request from three board members. That's, that's new. Uh, we thought that was good balance. Um, let's see what else. Um, item three, self-explanatory, I guess. Uh, we, we added a little bit more description of uh, working with the superintendent um, and uh, keeping, uh, keeping the superintendent in well, superintendent keeping the board chair informed and just fostering more of a, a working relationship between the two. Uh, and then getting into um, calling, uh, running the meeting effectively. And, as, and then you get to the vice chair. And here we added a fair amount because the vice chair's position up until this point had been basically fill in whenever the chair is, is absent. And we added um, some more language there uh, to foster a good working relationship between the vice chair and the chair uh, so that they're communicating. So when there, when there is an opportunity for the vice chair to step in, that they're not coming in cold to any issues and they're ready to kind of step in at a moment's notice, um, which we thought was, was, was healthy. Up until this point, there was only the one line item three, which is basically, uh, I think it was just the one, which is fill in just in case somebody's sick. So we added more. Uh, we added more there to that position. And then secretary, we had nothing on the secretary, so we uh, we added language in the secretary. Uh, most of this is coming from Cape. Uh, some of it uh, is coming from uh, 
couple of things we picked up from uh, another school district or two. Uh, same thing with the with the treasurer, and that brings us to the bottom of the bylaw. So at that point, I'll stop and ask questions or, or field questions. Right? Yeah, I move that we adopt <coughs> bylaw nine one two one as proposed. Second. There's a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, let's move to, I think, is the next one construction of the agenda? Uh, it says Ninety formulation of administrative regs. Oh, thank 93 you. 93 and 13. Yeah, I've got these. They're not quite, they were <laughs> queued. They're not queued anymore, so thank yeah. you. All right, this one is brand new, which is why it's an all red. But actually, I think a very, we think, a very important one to add, and so does the superintendent. So this one is a, is calling out the formulation of administrative regulations. So in short, this basically says that the board is responsible for establishing policies and bylaws. It is the superintendent's job to execute uh, those policies, and those and the execution of those policies may require written uh, procedures um, that will flow down to the staff. As a, as a sweep, it's called, uh, referred to as regulations. Um, so I think it's uh, it's an important distinction of, between roles and responsibilities and make sure that it's clear that it's the superintendent's job is to, is to take the policies beyond the board and into the school district. Any questions? Great. Yeah, I'm having a hard time understanding just what the administrative regulations are practices, how we actually carry out the policies. You said a big book of policies and a big book of regulations. Right. Now it's all online, but the board doesn't cover regulations, so we don't see them anymore. So we could if we wanted to. We could, but I don't want to. <laughs> we I don't want to. But, yeah. no. but, but the, the question is, if, we're, if we have administrative regulations and we have to make them in a particular way, do we need to be engaged in some kind of rulemaking? No. Because normally regulations, to be, to be enforceable, have to be made in accordance with some, I don't know, I'm just asking the question, I'm not trying to be difficult. We have to make it in accordance with the policies you create. So it's administering based on the policies. So your oversight helps us determine how we're going to carry forth practice. And I just would add that on occasion, not often, but there will be a policy, usually the state will yeah. say that there's a form is required or, um, a, you know, the formation of a committee is required and they will report at such and such a time. So on occasion, there's, there's implied regulation um, in a policy, but we don't actually have, it, it's the administration's job to, to put that into place. But, but there's a line in here that says the Board of Ed does not adopt administrative rule unless required by law or requested by the superintendent. What if the board wanted to adopt a regulation to tell the superintendent how to implement something? We would be we're precluding ourselves from doing it, are we? No, I think that's the point. Yeah. Is the point, and there, you know, there are other bylaws that will, that, that over time, we'll get to that also, you know, reinforce the. the the fact that the superintendent is the CEO of the district and it's the board's role to govern through policy um, and, and monitor against those policies and refrain from crossing the line in, in trying to actually govern, uh, actually run the district. Uh, so this is again reinforcing what that means. And so yeah, we are consciously saying that's not our job. Our job is to write policy and if we have to, because the law says that there's something specific, we can call that out. But that's where it stops. All right, but, but how do, for example, let, let's say the board decided that we needed to implement a hiring. <coughs> how would we do that? By simply not appropriating money? <coughs> what if this, I mean, you know, because what if money were taken from some other line item in order but, to pay for something? Well, that, that would be, I, I believe that would be, that would come in the form of a director. That we would, we would put a motion on the floor, we'd vote on that. Um, money can't be moved around the budget uh, without board approval anyway. That's a, we have a policy that covers that. Right. So, so in something like that, I don't think we need to. 
We wouldn't want something like that to be in policy, in policy anyway. anyway. That's too. That's too. Um, top. That's too immediate. What, what, what's the need? A, a hiring freeze. Yeah. Yeah. A, a hiring no, freeze. But but how, how does the board implement it if we can't enact the regulation to implement it? We can't direct the superintendent not to hire. Anybody. No. Well, it says it says. First of all, I'm not sure that we, that directive would find its way through as policy. It would be a motion, which is a directive, but the last paragraph says we reserve the right to review and direct revisions of administration. So if we do find something that we're not happy with, we could we could we could we can come in over on top of the superintendent and say mm -hmm. that was that was close, but we'd like to see it changed to that particular regulation. So we have an opportunity to course correct. The superintendent, if the board feels like it needs to, yeah. But, but if the superintendent just does stuff and doesn't make a regulation. How do you go back in and do that? That, that I think that now we're getting into well, now, now we get now we get into this, a, we're, we're, I think we're getting into a performance <laughs> issue and, and and whether or not the board thinks the superintendent is is executing uh, do, doing her job. I mean, I think it'd be very unusual that the board would do that. But the, the difficulty you get is, is if it, it, I'm not talking about the present superintendent, but let's say you had a rogue superintendent mm -hmm. and you needed to control them. How would you do it if you for, if you eliminated the, the ability to enact regulations? You'd have to amend your bylaws. And if something were happening quickly, you wouldn't. Be, you, you might have to. You already said in here you can't change a bylaw without noticing it as part of a meeting and putting it in the public notice. So if, you, if something happened at a meeting that caused you to take great pause, you might not have the ability to act on it until you re-notice the meeting for another night. I'm just raising the issue. I'm, not, I'm just trying to think through things that the board has done in the 10 years I've been on the board and whether or not this precludes us from doing it, because this is new, that's why. But one of the things that we've said as a board over and over again um, is that we, we don't want to be in the business of micromanaging. It's not a good structure for a board of education to be doing that. We don't want to be doing that. Administration certainly doesn't want us to be doing that. So this is what this policy is delineating, exactly that goal, saying that we're, we're, we shouldn't be doing that and we don't want to do that. Any further comments? Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Say aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Okay. Um, we have a motion. Oh, we, we didn't. didn't. No. Oh, or a second. So moved. I'm sorry. Second. We'll go back. No, All right. So now we have a second. So all those in favor? Say aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. All right. We have one day. The motion passes okay. to uh, move this to uh, second. Michelle, could you do me a favor? What's the next 9, one? 9322, public and executive sessions. Types of thank you. It's about the types of meetings. Um, this is also I think collapses. Just give me a second. Yeah. So I missed the the note at the top here. Um, there's policy 9321.1, which is titled Working Sessions which is in the process going to be deleted because it's, it's covered in, in this broader bylaw regarding meeting definition. So we start with one, what is the definition of a meeting? Um, pointing out that there are three different types of meeting per FOIA, a regular, a special, and an emergency. Talks and defines uh, regular meetings uh, are. Uh, that we have to file them with the state by the 31st of January of each year. Um, 
Sorry, we're in violation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's probably, this was done purposely. <laughs> so we picked up something here that we, we, we thought was actually, and, and tonight's a good point, um, where we put the regular meeting shall not exceed three hours unless we vote to extend the meeting. Um, we thought this would be a good, a you good- found somewhere, we didn't just make that up. Yeah, we didn't make that up. That was pulled from another district. Um, but it sets up some, some uh, I guess, guide rails for the board to self-manage and not make meetings unnecessarily long. Amen. So we thought that was a good ad. Call on the move to adjourn. Well, you know, if people spoke less, we'd be out of here faster. Yeah. Emergency meetings. Um, there was, we didn't have anything describing what an emergency meeting was, and yet we could still hold one. Uh, language regarding cleaning up uh, what's, uh, what is um, subject to an executive or protected in an executive session, um, what a non-meeting is, and that's it. So it's all about meetings and meeting types. Any questions? Actually, I do have a question, and it was something I was thinking about, um, and it's about executive session. Mm -hmm. And I think we did it once before, but I kind of was wondering, in, in uh, light of time, having executive session prior to our meetings sometimes kind of gives us a little bit more structure, mm -hmm. um, because, well, I just, what? We'll be more alert. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll be more alert, and I think that it would also limit the time. So, if, and I know it's hard because we all have meetings, mm -hmm. but if we were to have a 6.30 to 7 o'clock executive session versus a 10.30 executive session, I think it might run more efficiently. And then if we needed to extend time to discuss, then maybe we agree to have 15 minutes added to the end or something. I just think I, the 11 to 11.30 meetings, I, I think, are a lot. And okay. I think it's something that I would, would like to but consider. It doesn't even have to be 6.30 to 7. It could be part of our meeting. It could be 7 to 7 to It could be 7 to 7 to However it is, I just think it's something to think about. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, we can. Thank you. Well, and then it's, okay. it would feel more, um, or it'd feel less disingenuous yeah. to actually come out into public and then vote on what was decided. True. Yeah. Because there yeah. is never any public life by the time right. we're done with the right. executive session. Mm -hmm. we, uh, I, I, There's other districts that do it. I would say, I, I would say, um, sure, why not? Um, however, I think it's situational because if we do have a public here waiting to, to comment, and so if we're going to say we're going to post, we're going to, uh, we posted a seven o'clock start. So if we're going to come in an executive session at six thirty, we've got to be disciplined and be out. Mm -hmm. We can run maybe a few yeah, minutes cool. over, but if we've got people here who want it, we need to keep <laughs> that in I mind. Like that. I kind of like that. I kind of like. I'm just yeah. saying for mm -hmm. something like what we're going to talk about tonight, that could be very could have easily been done prior. I think. But if it's going to be something that's a little stickier or may take us a little longer, mm -hmm. we got to, that will be taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. Let's put that out. Yeah. So, um, and speaking of moving things along, technically, folks, our bylaw as it sits today does not require first readings to have a motion. Okay. We've somehow along first the way. Readings to have a motion or policies to have Policy to first readings? For policy first readings, oh. which bylaw first readings there's nothing in our bylaws that require oh. a motion just saying we picked up that habit somewhere along the way so we can uh, uh, anyway just just FYI great I, I think 9322 is proposed to be well thought out and I think it really um, I, I commend the fact that we finally just decided that there were things that weren't meetings and now we have some guidelines that we can figure it out I think the simple solution is if you think executive session is going to take a half an hour, notice the meeting for 7.30 as opposed to noticing it for 7 o'clock. And if you think it's going to be an hour, well then maybe you do it after the meeting. Yep. Uh, yep. Or you start at 6.30 if you don't disrupt the meeting. I think it's, I think it's a great point. Um, and when we construct agendas going forward, we'll certainly okay. start thinking about that. There's yeah. no reason why we could There's no reason why we could well, is the, is the chair in indicating that we don't need to approve this then? We don't need to make a motion to go through that process? Well, that's that's actually thing. part of the agenda setting part, where, right? It, it doesn't say where in the agenda the executive session goes, does it? The, well, the point that was brought up 
was relative to executive, but it, this is not the bylaw that talks about construction of the agenda. Right, right. right. That's what I'm saying. So we can approve yeah, this. Yeah, we can approve this. Um, if the board would like to continue on its practice, you know, we because we're going to get to the point where we're going to talk about the bylaw that establishes policies and bylaw that establishes bylaws and the process for that. So we could, if we if we're going to we're going to change course, we could we could we could hold our tradition through tonight and change it when we get to that. So that's what I'm that's what I'm recommending, Greg. Here's the question, though: If you don't approve it for a first reading, if you don't go through that process. Then you put it on the consent calendar for the second reading. I wouldn't. Does it ever get approved? Have you ever actually yes. approved the bylaw? Yeah, because anything that's on a consent agenda gets approved by definition. The only thing a consent agenda does is it, it just, it, it, there's no need for discussion. Yeah, um, but it would be highly unusual for an organization not to take a formal vote to approve a bylaw. You are taking a formal vote. The consent agenda is, is a vote of the board. It, the absence of the vote per is a legitimate vote. I think we should talk about that when we get to it. Yeah, I'm not sure that's the case. But, I, no, but it is. Can but, Do we have a motion on the floor for no. 9322? No. I'll move we approve 9322 and second. No second? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Motion passes for first reading. Again, somebody, what's the next one? 9323, Agenda Construction and Materials. Thank you. All right. Keeping with the theme. So, um, again, we're, uh, I think we're consolidating another bylaw um, into, into this one. Well, I'll, let, me, let me come back and check on that. All right. So here we're, uh, again, a lot of cleanup. Um, talking about how uh, the agenda gets constructed uh, again we uh, this is not the order of business all right so there's another bylaw that deals with the order of business and that basically is the framework for the agenda itself like item one attendance item two we ask for the for public comment item three so on and so forth and that's where Jen since you brought it up well, that that order of precedent, or order of business rather, describes basically the outline that we that we see. The current bylaw has an order of precedence that says that's what you shall do. And we're not supposed to change that. Every time we do that, we're violating our own bylaw. Mm -hmm. The new bylaw, when it comes up, is basically going to say this is what we typically do, but we have discretion to change it as we see fit. So if we want to put executive session from the bottom, up to the top or in the middle, we can do whatever we want. Um, but that's not this. This is about how an agenda actually gets constructed. So it's about the chair or the superintendent um, putting together uh, uh, an agenda. A board board members can suggest items to the chair for inclusion um, in enough in sufficient time to be able to give the separate superintendent uh, time to review with the board chair. Uh, before making a decision as to whether or not the agenda item should be placed uh, or not. It still preserves the right for a board member to uh, uh, raise a motion to add something to an agenda during a meeting, but that again, that requires two-thirds of the vote. Um, it reminds us that agendas for special emergency meetings may not be amended, correct? Right? No, I, you, if you're going to continue explaining it, that's fine. I, I had a question about the last paragraph, though, on the on the posting. Good. Um, this says where this obligates us to post with the town clerk, but I could swear that Tom Mooney told me that because we're a regional school district, I asked the question of whether we needed to post something 24 hours of time when the town clerk's office was open. I could swear he told me you don't even need to post there. You can post it on your website because you're a regional district. And the requirement of posting in town clerks, I thought, was for municipal school districts because that's the clerk of the municipality. Whereas we don't have a clerk in our municipality. We, we are like a municipality. We're a quasi-municipality, even though we don't have the tax income. Um, so I, I, I guess I just would want to make sure we're not undertaking something that we're not legally obligated to do, even though we always post there. I'm just not sure we have to. 
Yeah, because yeah. that was it was one of my frustrations because of the fact that we hold Monday meetings and we do have some town offices that are closed and it, it does create a challenge for us to make certain that we're hitting those 24 hours and um, those timelines so <coughs> we can look I into thought, I thought we checked I'm pretty sure I raised it because we had an issue with posting for our building right, committee we'll, meeting on a Monday. We'll take the action back and we'll, we'll check to see if, if we actually are compelled to do that or not. Uh, other than that, I think it's great. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Thank you. The motion. Passes. Next one. Nine three two five point one quorum. Yeah, this is a tough one, so hopefully we won't. What? This is a real tough one. All right, and I don't even know where this one is. I can read the whole thing. So please read it. Um, all right. It says a majority of the members of the board shall constitute a quorum at any regular, special, or emergency meeting. The board may take no action in the absence of a quorum except to adjourn to another date unless this bylaw is waived in accordance with bylaw 9314, which is 9314, just for a reference, is suspension of policies, bylaws, and regulations. And just so you know, well, everyone's probably looking at it, but most of that is red because all our old policy said was the majority of the members of the board shall constitute a quorum. Have we seen that policy that this refers to? Nine, three, Suspension one, of policies, bylaws, regulations, 9314. Yeah. It's actually a bylaw. Did we, I don't think we've done that one. No. We haven't, but, the, but it's, we're okay to the existing one, so we're not creating a conflict. Okay, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to it, but it hasn't changed. Yeah. We have it. I didn't know we could waive that. We can. Apparently. We can. So, do I have a motion? Well, 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 wait, 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 sorry. wait, wait a minute. How, do, I mean, if you don't have a quorum, how does a group of fewer than a quorum waive that? I mean, think about that. It would be like I came to a meeting, no one else showed up, and I voted to waive. How about I hereby move to waive no. the quorum requirement? So, Let's have a meeting. So, I can read, it's very short 9314. Suspension of policies, bylaws, and regulations. It says policies, bylaws, and Board of Education adopted regulations shall be subject subject to suspension for a specified purpose and limited time by a majority vote of all members of the Board of Education at a meeting in the call for which the proposed suspension has been described in writing or upon a two-thirds vote of all members of the Board of Education when no such written notice has been given. So uh, I, 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 think, I think it doesn't apply to a quorum. You, you can't amend the quorum requirement. And I'd be violently opposed to anything that allows us to amend the quorum requirement because that's tantamount to allowing rule by a minority and it's just <coughs> not right. And, and if you've got to take the vote, you, you're, never, you're not going to take a vote at this meeting and say, we're going to hold a special meeting next week, but only four of us can be there. So. You know, let's let's vote not to do it because it's just bad policy. It's just not smart. Well, the whole board, first of all, so you need two thirds of the total board <laughs> to enact a waiver of our our, our, of our bylaws. Yeah, but why, but why would you do that? Because if you did that, it, it, let's say you had a majority that decided that it wanted to have a three-person group run the board, so it waived it, and meetings were called when only three people could be there. Call it the executive. It's just not right. It should not apply to this, and I think we should take out that reference. Al, I don't think it's smart. I think, I think we're, we're oversimplifying this a little bit. Um, you would think that this is dangerous because you have a meeting and four people show up and they decide, hey, let's vote and kill a quorum, we can do something. But if you need two thirds of the majority of the board to do that, clearly what you're doing is, it's impossible to do that in that meeting. So clearly what you're doing is you're planning on a meeting. In other words, you're saying, look, we have a meeting next week, and only three of us can get there, but we've got to get this building committee funded. <clears throat> so let's pre-plan and <coughs> absolve that meeting of its quorum. <coughs> so two-thirds of us all present on this Wednesday say, this meeting next Monday that only three of us can be at, because 
finally have the numbers at, and we're going to clarify this, we're going to give that less than quorum assemblage of board members permission <coughs> under this extreme circumstance to vote, to, to, to make a uh, motion and, and make a decision uh, that is uh, um, supported by the whole board. So I don't really think, I think it's impossible to, to do this minority real thing, uh, rule thing you're talking about because you still need more than a quorum to make it happen. Therefore, I believe okay. you're allowing yourself to pre-plan. So what, go ahead, Kirk. I think when it comes to things like quorum, it's bad because even as, as I've been desperate to get certain things done for the building committee to meet deadlines that we have, but I'll tell you what, there is no circumstance under which I want three people on this board or four people to make a decision that has consequences, uh, especially financial consequences, because the last thing I want is that situation to exist, because the other eight are going to say, well, don't blame us, we didn't have anything to do with it. And, I, and if we're going to make a decision that requires the board, I want the whole board there. That would be my preference, but that, that's neither here nor there. So, I so think it is wrong to have the ability to waive the requirement of a quorum, and I don't care if it's two-thirds. You want to make it unanimous, fine. Make it unanimous, but maybe it ought to be unanimous, because every single one of us ought to have a veto over that. Otherwise, I think it's a really bad policy. I disagree. I think it gives us a little bit of flexibility. It still sets the bar very high for, for you know, changing what is a normal um, procedure I just, for the board. I do feel like I need to clarify. It, it just says a, a majority vote. The two-thirds was if it had not been on the written agenda. Uh, it's not, yeah, it, it's, it's a two-thirds, it's, it's, it's a majority vote. vote. That's the way I read it. All right, so we haven't done 9314. So I'm going to suggest that we wait. Oh. We can we can move this to, to second, but if, but we won't we won't discuss we won't put it back I won't put it back on the agenda until we do it in concert with 9314. So we can pair it up. So if we want to make a change, we make a change. I, the thing is, I I, I kind of agree with Kirk that the problem isn't 9314 because that's the problem is its application to court. Okay, so you're going to have to. When we get to 9314, you're going to have to carve out an exception that says you could waive policies except for 9325-1. I like that. You have to go the other way. Right. Right? So you're going to have to take the inverse of this and make sure it shows up in the other bottle. Okay. okay. So we'll make that change. With that, I'd still like to move. With that, with that being a change, I'd like to move this thing forward. Well... So with the, How can you do that? So we, yeah. can, we, we can move this forward. For first reading. For first reading without the second sentence. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say you have to take this. We have to strike, so we have to strike that out. Right, but, but Amanda, didn't you say that it has to be done in tandem with the 9314? No, I, no I was suggesting that if we wanted to, we wouldn't do the second reading until uh, we'll do it until coincident it with 9314. So if there's any question of connection, you know, it would be cleared up. Well, 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 what, what's, I mean, what's the almighty rush? Let's just have them both on the table at the same time to do it. I mean, you know, if, if that bylaw gets passed two, three weeks later, I mean, the world because, is going to end. Because we're going to have to talk about this again, and it's already 1030, and if we can get it through first yeah. reading, it's one less vote we're going to need to take yeah. unless we decide not to vote on these things. No, but you can put it, in, once we reach agreement on it, then you can put it on the consent agenda, and it's done. So you don't really need another meeting. I, 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 well, you need another meeting, but you don't need a, it's not going to create any burdensome requirement. You're not finished going through the bylaws yet, are we? No, we don't have a motion yet. I so. make a motion to um, approve this uh, bylaw 9325.1 with the uh, removal of the reference to bylaw 9314. Second. All right. Motion to second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. And I think there's one Nin more. And it's 9325.3 parliamentary procedure. It's the toughest one yet. So it just uh, updates this to reflect uh, Robert's rules, uh, new, uh, new revised or new lead revised. In other words, clarifying the specific
specifically which edition we're referring to. Correct. I move to uh, accept uh, for first reading bylaw 9325.3. Thank you. All those in favor? Before you do that, I have a quick Aye. observation. Go ahead. My observation is only this. I'm going to vote in favor of it. <coughs> you recognize that one of the primary rules of Robert's Rules of Order is that any time the majority wishes to abandon them and, and, and suspend them, you can do it. So what this, what this really means is we're going to operate in accordance with Robert's Rules until the majority of us decide, decide not to. Not to. <laughs> Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's wonderful. But it actually is a good footnote to the back to the suspension bylaws that maybe we, this is another one that should not be suspended. But no, you shouldn't do that because there are times when Robert's Rules doesn't get you there. And that's why it contains a provision that allows the majority to suspend it. Remember, Robert's Rules exist in order to create civility in meetings and to move business. They're, 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 not, they're not a be all end all. So there are times when you want to suspend. It seems a lawyer would have figured out the work. So we have a second. Yeah, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Pass it to And now session. we're going to, we have a motion to have a second. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We're in executive session. We don't need to move. We can okay. stay right here. No, please.